Hey, three bookers, hey, cover to cover club members, and hi, paper cutters. It is Neil Pasricha, and I want to welcome you back to chapter 102 of our 333 chapter pilgrimage to uncover and discuss the 1,000 most formative books in the world. How are you liking the new experiments we are doing? We got a new logo. We debuted in chapter 100. We're trying, since chapter 99, to, to see what does it feel like to have no intro on this show? What if we just play the click-click and just run right into the conversation? Of course, I'm always around at the end for the post-game, for the after-party, for the end of the podcast club, playing your voicemails, reading your letters, going through the word of the chapter, hanging out with the highlight quotes, adding three books to the top 1,000. We're always going to party at the end, but I'm experimenting a little bit with having no introduction at the beginning. Now, of course, if you're hearing me say that, you're probably like, well, then what's this? Isn't this an introduction? And I guess I'm exploring whether or not certain chapters need some contextual <laughs> scene setting. For example, this one was recorded just before the pandemic live at the 92nd Street Y in Manhattan. Okay, I flew down to New York. Susan Kane came down to New York. Susan Kane, of course, the author of Quiet, uh, The Power of Introverts in a World That Can't Stop Talking, author of the sort of game-changing book that's sort of taken the world by storm, been a New York Times bestseller for seven years, right? We caught her in the midst of writing her new book, which didn't even have a, a title at the time, as you're going to hear in this conversation, but has now since come out, debuted on the New York Times bestseller list, and is called Bittersweet. How Sorrow and Longing Help Make Us Whole. So I feel like you need to know that this was recorded before the pandemic at a live audience at the 92nd Street Y, right? So you have that. And then, of course, in the conversation or right after the conversation, Susan's like, could you release this chapter, you know, when my book comes out? Well, the book didn't come out for two years. So we've been holding this live conversation for the two years, waiting for Bittersweet to come out. And you're going to hear in this conversation, Susan's three most formative books, but also you're going to hear a lot about her writing process, a lot about her writing craft, how she thinks about writing, and a lot of the genesis of the new book. It's going to be very exciting and interesting. Without any further ado, let's jump right down to New York City, live at the 92nd Street Y, our first live chapter, I'm pretty sure, in front of an audience, and let's hang out with the one and only Susan Kane. Let's go. I find her truly inspiring, and I'm so delighted that she accepted my invitation to come down here tonight and tell us all about her three most formative books. Can you join me, please, in welcoming Ms. Susan Kane? Susan, thank you so much for coming on Three Books. Thank you so much for having me. I am delighted to have you. I'm going to make sure this is recording. It is. We're going to make sure this is recording. Thumbs up from the back. Mm -hmm. And I thought to start this conversation, if you don't mind, I've pulled from your vast archives of writing three quotes that you have said or written that involve the word books or reading. Wow, just, okay. Just to set a little... <laughs> Oral tap, like little landscape for us. Um, and you guys, uh, you know, I have some inkling of the amount of background research that Neil does before each of these podcasts. It's really voluminous and impressive. And so I have no idea what he is about to pull out of his hat. Mm. Very curious. Great. Well, I, uh, voluminous. So that could be the word of the chapter already in the first minute. Um, so from your TED talk, you, and so for these, you can offer a reflection back or you can be like, Thumbs up if you want, whatever you, whatever comes to mind. From your TED Talk, Susan, you said, and it's in your book as well, in my family, reading was the primary group activity. You had the animal warmth of your family sitting right next to you, but you were also free to go roaming around the adventure land in your mind. Yeah, I mean, that, that was the family in which I grew up, and... Um, Orth Orthodox... Jewish. Yeah, it was an Orthodox to, Jewish family. Yeah. Um, and <clears throat> excuse me, that that um, that family culture of reading, it was in my immediate family. It was also with my grandfather who didn't live with us, but um, he but we saw him every week and would go to visit him. And I guess I talked about this in my TED talk. He lived in this mm -hmm. apartment in which every spare surface was mm -hmm. covered by piles of books and like I used to just love going to his place and roaming around and seeing all the books and just feeling their presence. And, you know, he, he would basically spend his days 
sitting and reading these books and then creating sermons out of whatever he had been reading that week. And I watched that process with a kind of grand fascination. Like, I don't think I understood that it, I would have a life that echoed that in some way, but I felt it in some What deep decade way. was this, the reading in a room together? Oh, gosh. We um, that would have seven, been in the 1970s. 70s? Yeah, I was born in 68. Can people so. do that today? Do you? Because we have a, a live <clears throat> audience here. Can you put your hand up if you and your family read quietly together? Do people do that? I, I got maybe a, th- a quarter of the room. Anyone want to? Because I can't yeah, get my family even, to do I know. This. I was going to say. I'm a I, huge reader. I, no I wasn't my f- raising my hand me, yeah, because my the, kids don't do that either. How, it's really hard. But be yeah. at a quarter of but the people I'm in this so room glad that some of you do. are either lying yeah. <laughs> or they have figured. Some, what do you do? How do you get that going? There's the internet now. There's TVs. There's cell phones. There's, it's insane. Anyone want to throw someone out? What do you get? How do you inspire your family to read with you? Jim Levine in the front row, past guest on three books, literary agent to me and Tom Brady. <laughs> yes, Jim, what do you do? Go on vacation together, which we did over this holiday, and just hanging out together with nobody being pressured to do everything. Everybody brought a book, and so we're all sitting around together reading, and it was just wonderful. So it wasn't forced. It's not like, I guess my point is, if, if you raise children who are readers, and if you happen to marry somebody who's a reader, as I did, uh, in fact, in college, one of my professors, his main advice was, marry a woman who can read. You'll have a very happy life together. Aha, uh-huh. marry a woman who can read. Um, hard not to do. Oh, a life story, okay. <laughs> Yeah. Being in their mind, it, and then had that notion kind of Yes. vacation creates that bubble that, that you had with your family too. Like con- like it's like a, we're all together, we got we all have a book, you know, potentially there's nothing else, you know, in a way there's not much else to do. If you're all in a room together yeah, on vacation. Yeah, yeah, no, I think there's a certain kind of coziness. And it's funny because I'm just coming back from a family vacation now. And um, in our family, it's Settlers of Catan. Like that, my boys want to play that over and over and over again during vacation. So I, I don't know. I guess it's whatever thing you have that's uniting your there's family. There's some, some reading involved in the game, no? Uh, minimal. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah. thank you. But it's good. It's good. Okay, how about this one? Page 265, the conclusion of quiet. Just It's part of your kind of the big the big kind of thing at the end you say spend your free time the way you like not the way you think you're supposed to stay home on new year's eve if that's what makes you happy skip the committee meeting cross the street to avoid making aimless chit chat with random acquaintances read cook run and i pulled that out because the word read in the middle but there is a something about your body of work that's just so perfectly articulated in that paragraph yeah, you know, it's so funny that you picked that out because I, I suppose in some ways that's kind of a through line of my life, which is just like there are a thousand messages that the world is sending you all the time that unwittingly stand in between um, you and the life that you really are meant to be leading. Mm. And I think you have to be really um, thoughtful about it and really proactive about figuring out what what how, how do you really truly want to be spending your time because otherwise um you you be, you're not even conscious of mm. all of these different forces that are operating on you and i'm not saying you know just do whatever the heck you want and everybody else be damned like that's not what i'm saying at all you you obviously want to be taking into account the people you love and your social and professional obligations but i'm saying once you've taken all those things into account there's still this tremendous field of play that's out there for you um if you're willing to let go of the FOMO um, and of the sense of internal guilt that we all feel when we're not living up to what we think we're supposed to be doing with our time. Oh, that's very beautiful. The part that jumped out to me in that phrase the most was cross the street to yeah. avoid making aimless chit chat with random acquaintances. Yeah, because... Is that something you do? <laughs> I will say... 
not only is it something I do, but if you take a look at all the letters that I get, and even just the random articles that I see online of people talking about my work or related work, a lot of people do that. Ah. Um, and they all feel guilty about it. They all feel like it's weird, and yet they're all doing it. Uh -huh. And I, I think that if we were ever able to get to the point of letting go of, I shouldn't do X because X is weird or mm -hmm. X is, you know, not what's socially yeah. acceptable. Um, we'd be completely different beings. So. Yeah, I remember in uh, the book of Awesome, I had a little entry called uh, "When the social event you didn't want to go to gets canceled." Yeah, that right? feeling and of then, relief. And then yeah. when I'd written that on the blog, people wrote like "Introverts Unite," or people were like, "That sounds like people had totally different reactions to that." But I right. totally agree with you. Um, thank you for, for writing that. And then sure. the last one was, it's from a podcast you did on the knowledge project where the host Shane Parrish asked you, <laughs> the question was, Susan, what is your process for reading a book? And you replied, reading is too precious a thing to apply the word process to. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's so funny because I actually, I feel like there's this thing that's happened in the world of podcasting where everything is about you know, creating optimization and systems and like the best system for this um, and the best strategy for that. So I feel like there's this cultural vogue right now for everything being optimized and thought through as a system and a strategy as opposed to just doing something you love yeah, to what's do up with and that? not really paying Is that the attention. Tim Ferriss effect? I think it is a little bit because he's so amazing at doing that and and hacking I, your I, life. Yeah. And, you know, I get Tim's five bullets email yeah. thing every Friday. Who and there's almost always something really great in it. So, like, yeah, you know, all a new power keyboard to that. shortcut. It's just that's not the only way of being. Um, so, like, to me, the idea of applying a word like process or a th even the, the whole idea of a system about something, now I'm saying the same thing about something as precious as reading, which takes place in a completely different sphere of life. How do we value life. that? as much or more than the things that we can measure, like the... the I don't think we I should be using words like value mm, right. also. Okay. I think we should just be reading our books and like... Shut up about talking about it. No, no, I, I don't say that, but like... Cancel the podcast. To me, the, the, the whole point of like... <laughs> no, I don't say that. It's that the, the, the thing that's so precious about reading, um, you know, Proust has this saying about it that... that I may be getting the exact no, words no, wrong, okay. but that that reading is the fruitful miracle of a communication in the midst of solitude. Um, so, you know, you read a book and you are like mainlining into another person's heart and soul and they into yours, even though they can't see you, they their may mind, not even be alive anymore. Yeah. Everything about them mm -hmm. is, is there and you're like connected at that moment. And that's what it's really for. Yeah, Stephen King says it's telepathy or telepathy. Yeah, I don't yeah. know how to pronounce that I don't word. either, but... Does anyone know? <clears throat> Telepathy. No mm. one knows. Just kidding. Well, it's, just it's because you're all a room full of readers. So I don't know if you've had this We're experience. We're at the 96th Street so Y in New York words. City. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah. but like if you're a reader, there's all these words you don't know how to pronounce because uh -huh. you've just seen them on the page. Because you, you just know, said like, Proust. And I was like, who's that? The Marcel <laughs> guy from France? Like, I, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, like, I'm like jumping. I'm like, isn't it Proust? <laughs> but yeah, this is the thing that happens. With the so you're saying when people can't pronounce words, it's good because it means that they read a lot. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for giving us the three like contextual quotes. Um, of, uh, of of reading because I thought that would be a nice way to like just level set the playing field, talk about our love of books. This yeah. this podcast, by the way, three books is for by and for book book lovers, writers, makers, sellers, and librarians. So we really aim for people that love books or want to love books more. Which is by the way, what happened to me. I didn't read at all like a few years ago, zero, like pretty much nothing. I fell back in love with it, and this mm -hmm. is like a reflection of that love. And part of that love is reading your three most formative books. So can we jump into them sure. now? Hmm. What I'll do, Susan, and for the audience is for each book, I will introduce it with like a little one minute kind of thing as if you're looking at the book in the bookstore. Because remember, there's thousands of people listening to this that we can't see and they can't see us. So it's like I want them to picture the book. And then I'll ask you, Susan, to tell us about your relationship. And we could go from there. Yeah, sure. Okay. So the very first book that was formative to you is Claudine at School by Colette, originally published as Claudine à l'école in 1900 and translated into English in 1956 by Farrar, Strauss, and Kudahi. I'm sure that's correct. Gabrielle Colette was born in 1873. She died in 1954. She's from France. This was the very, very first 
of 80 volumes of fiction, memoir, drama, essays, and criticism she wrote in her lifetime, and it became a huge national bestseller in France when it came out in the year 1900. By some accounts, this book was forcibly written while she was locked in a room by her much older husband, Willie, who took full credit and authorship for the books. The original cover, of course, has by Willie, or par Willie on the cover, not her, any mention of her name. A drawing of a young girl with long hair wearing a red shawl bent over writing in a book. Dewey Decimal Heads, you can file this one under 843.92. That's French fiction in the 21st century. It's, a, it's the first of a four-part series, sometimes considered one of the very first queer or modern YA books with the female protagonist. It reads like a diary and is a coming-of-age story retelling the final year of secondary school of 15-year-old Claudine, her brazen confrontations and intimate interactions with her headmistress and affairs and private thoughts of her fellow students. Tell us about your relationship with the incredible, and, I, and by the way, I, 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 I completely loved and devoured this book, so thank you. Your relationship with Claudine at School by Colette. Yeah, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm trying to think where to start. So, um, okay, I came from the family that we just talked about, and... Uh, but we talked about, but tell us, you can open that up for us a bit. Yeah, I, I, I'm going to, because um, my family were also Anglophiles and Bibliophiles, so... We went every summer to London, or almost every summer to London. So bibliophile is someone who loves books. Yeah. Anglophile is someone who loves... England. And England, Like okay. all things English. Okay. And so we just had this thing where we would go to London almost every summer, and there are these really famous bookstores in London. Um, and, you know, in those days there was no Amazon or anything, so there were all these British books that were amazing that you couldn't get in the States, especially for kids. Um, and so we literally would go with like an empty suitcase wow. to the every summer to these bookstores and fill it up with all these books um, <clears throat> that I really came to love. And while I was a kid, these books were all like very innocent. Um, there were tons of boarding school stories mm. that were the precursors of what Harry Potter became later. Mm. Um, and I remember as a kid reading them and thinking, the only thing that's weird about these books is that these kids never seem to have a crush on anyone. Like they ah, never would talk about that. Right. And then, and then one summer um, we got there and I suddenly realized I was too old for all those books and I didn't know what I was going to read anymore. How old were um, you? I don't remember. Yeah, I like don't know. Teenager. I, yeah, yeah. I was probably 13 or mm -hmm. something. I don't, I don't know exactly. Um, and my father actually said, well, you know, you might like this writer Colette. Um, it wasn't actually at first Claudine at school. It was a different one. Um, but anyway, I, I started reading this book and it was like, Colette's like, um, if you think of a narrator like Pippi Longstocking um, for kids, which is the, the kind of protagonist who doesn't have parents and is completely free spirited and can do whatever the heck she wants. Um, Claudine was like the more grown up version yeah, of that, yeah. like that on steroids. And although I came from this family that on the one hand encouraged roaming around your interior adventure land while you were reading, it was also an extremely strict, um, traditional values kind of family. Um, so I was, I, in my real life, I was on an extremely short leash. And starting around age 13, my mother and I, my mother with whom I was extremely close, and I started to have terrible battles that, re that lasted for decades. I'm actually writing about them in my next book. Um, and they were basically battles over, you know, the freedom to be who you are in, in the context of a, an extremely traditional society. And so I, I, I look back now. Well, like um, about what? Oh, gosh. I mean, it was everything. It was like dating. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, that was really the big one, mm -hmm. you know, that you weren't supposed could, to. Could you date or not? Yeah, mm -hmm. things like that. Um, and and <coughs> You me. were against it. She really wanted you to have somebody. <laughs> you got it. Um, yeah, and, and it so happened, um, I wasn't actually being raised in a, in a neighborhood that had those kinds of traditional values, so all my friends were over here, and my family was over there. So there was lots of... Where was that? Uh, this was in Long Island okay. when I was growing up. Yeah. Yeah, so, so you in my day-to-day -day life, you know, there, uh, my mom and I in particular were fighting these incredibly painful battles, and like really deeply painful because... She was also the person I was closest to in the world. You love um, that. Yeah, yeah. And, and, so, and so a book like this comes, and you know, 
the the, the protect you, you read within the Claudine first few pages cool. she's making out with uh, another girl <laughs> in her class yeah, who then is just, the headmistress of the school steals that woman that girl from her and makes out with her and she's jealous like this is in the first few pages yeah and she book. also has this kind of indomitable spirit right mm-hmm. where you just feel like she's going to do whatever the heck yes. she wants to do yes um and um and it's funny there are a lot of ways in which she's not like me at all like the word malicious comes up a million times in this book and I remember even as a kid thinking why does she want to be so malicious like I'm a, I'm a much sort of more eager to please and cozy person than this protagonist and yet she represented to me this kind of wild freedom that I was really um craving right and she gave uh, you something you didn't yeah have or, or what that you were not exposed to yeah it was something like that and uh and and, and, and I knew that Colette, the woman who had written these books, she was one of France's most preeminent writers. Mm-hmm. Um, actually, up until two days ago, I had always believed that she was the first woman to be elected to the Académie Française, which is the, the really prestigious body in France. Um, yeah. Of, of, like, yeah, and, the towering and I figures think of no, arts I think and the letters. Nobel Prize as well, if I'm, I'm not, not mistaken. Sure, but Some gigantic award. Anyway, she award didn't actually win that, but I always thought she did. So she uh-huh. was like my model. I wanted to be, yeah. you know, I wanted to live freely the way she did and write freely and like that. So that's what it shaped for you. I was just about yeah. to say, live freely, write freely. Have you done it? Is that is that where you did it? That was that a stepping stone to where you are now? Yeah, actually, completely. Like I, I really do feel like I've gotten to a point where I now live more or less the life that I want to live. Um, but, you know, it was hard fought, as I think it is for all of us in our different ways, right? We all have different obstacles that stand between us and where we're supposed to be. And, um, and which I told you is like a theme for me. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you know, like this book, I hadn't actually picked it up in, I don't know, maybe 30 years. And I only just picked it up a few days ago in getting ready for this. Yeah, but when I but, asked you for which three books were most formative, in your note to me, you said, it's got to be a Colette book. Which one? There's so many. Maybe yeah. this one. This is her first. Yeah. Came to you quickly. And can I ask just for the the kind of, not closing, because this is life and life is dynamic and always moving, but like, and where's, how did your relationship with your mom then move forward? Oh, yeah. Well, I'm actually writing about that right now, so I'm not kind of ready to talk about it all. Um, but yeah, you know, it was painful and hard fought for decades, really. Um, and I would say we finally reached resolution now towards the end of her life. Um, it's funny, she not funny, but um, she has Alzheimer's right now. But especially in her Alzheimer's, she has become the, the way I remember her from childhood before we started having wow. these pitched battles about who I was going to be. Um, so that's been really Is there interesting. an anecdote or an Like I, I had gotten yeah. to a point of, um, I'd gotten to a point of being comfortable in that stepping away and that independence even before she got there. Yeah. But now she's also there. This book talks a lot about gender. Uh-huh. <laughs> okay. Yep. So um, Colette, or sorry, uh, I keep saying Colette. You know, her, her full name is Gabrielle Colette, but. Um, but everyone called her everyone Colette. Everyone called her yeah. Colette. Just, yeah. I love, I love that. Mm-hmm. We should just start calling you Kane. <laughs> Kane is here tonight. Um, gender. The book explores many themes of gender and sexuality. And in the introduction by Judith Thurman, famous New Yorker writer who wrote the definitive bio on Colette, she writes, this is from the introduction of this book, she writes, Colette believed that gender is impure, that children of either sex have drives to dominate and yearnings to be possessed, that a society which demands too much conformity in the realm of desire irrevocably warps its young. And this was in the year 1900. Yeah. This book came out yeah. 120 years ago. Uh, so I was going to say, you have two sons, if I'm not mistaken, they're t- 10 do. and 12. Yep. Um, I've got three, uh, five and under. The world post-gender norms seems so liberating and confusing at the same time. Like, it's like we're in the mud. You know what I mean? So... Your mom, how do you think about navigating gender conversations with your kids? How should we be thinking about it these days with ourselves? Can we open that up using this book as a bit of a stepping stool into like an interesting conversation about gender? I mean, I don't know. You know, when I first read the stuff that was in this book, I guess I I was a kid, so 
it didn't really occur to me that it was anything remarkable for its time, right? Um, but it seemed to me obvious and self-evident that, of course, you would have a character who was just living life the way she wanted to live it, because it seemed to me that is how everybody should be living. Yeah. And I guess what I mean by that is, um, obviously within the, I, I, again, I just want to be careful to say, I'm not, <clears throat> I'm not talking about do what you want and screw everybody else. I'm saying that there's plenty of room to love the people around you and honor the people around you and be your full self. Um, and we should be granting that to each other all the time. And that's all a long way of saying when it comes to kids, I mean, I just feel like whatever you truly believe is going to communicate itself to your children and to your spouse and everybody around you, whether you like it or not. So if you truly believe that your children should be who they are, your children are going to know that. And I don't think we actually need to have these incredibly complex conversations unless the children indicate that they want the conversations, then fine. I, I'm just saying, I, I, I don't think it needs to be that complicated mm -hmm. if you are starting from the premise of, I honor who you are. And mm -hmm. of course I do. Why would I do anything else? Yeah. I feel that way logically about my own kids. And then I randomly scream at them for something. And I'm like, oh my, you know what I mean? Like it's, it's what you believe and what you do it. But I mean, yeah. I think screaming at them for like... I scream I at them a lot. I scream. I just <laughs> scream at my kids. <laughs> but I mean, that, I, that to me, that's in a completely different category mm. from the question you're asking. Because mm -hmm. like, yeah, I mean, all parents lose their temper sometimes. They've had a hard day or their kids are acting out. But that's different from what do you fundamentally see your children for who they are? Yeah. That's a much more deep and baseline thing that you're either communicating or not right and if you're there you're there they know you're there and they can act accordingly yeah and i don't mean to say it these things should never get articulated into words of course they should i'm just saying that the the great indispensable foundation of all of that is what do you truly believe like mm -hmm. how do you truly view them because that they're going to know that yeah totally okay okay this is good this is good uh life i want to talk about uh colette Okay, so Colette had, by all all views, a fascinating life. Put up your hand in, in this room, just so I can. Who, how many people are familiar with Colette? Okay, there's like, uh, yeah, like like a uh, maybe a, a fifth of the room. There was actually just a movie that came out about her a few months ago, which I didn't get to see, but but it's out it there. It was going to be I, zero before. No, I'm, I'm just sorry. I don't. It's called remember. Colette. The movie oh, is well, called there Colette. You go. Yeah, I watched the trailer to prepare for this. Right, with Kira Knightley playing yes. Colette. That's yes, right. Kira Knightley. Yeah. Uh, but there, for those that don't know much about her life, because I knew nothing about her life until you told me about this book, other than I was like, I didn't even know the name. Um, Colette was married three times. She had many lovers of both sexes, including a domineering husband who was much older than her and the lesbian trans niece of Napoleon. She caused a riot, which is, her name was Missy. Is, she had a very public uh, relationship in, in France. She caused a riot when she kissed I believe it was Missy, or if not another woman on stage in, in, in France during a stage show, it caused a riot. Like there was a riot after this. She seduced and had a five year long affair with her 16 year old stepson when she was in her late 40s. And as a parent, she had one child in her 40s. She showed absolutely no interest in raising her child. She had one child. She ultimately gave the job to someone else. She said, This is her quote I was saved from the danger which threatens the writer elevated to a happy and tender parent and becoming a mediocre author. At the same time, she produced 80 published works and 120 years later, we're talking about her. You've publicly talked about how when you became a writer, I believe in your 30s, you gave yourself the goal of having one published book by age 75. Yeah. That was yeah. the goal you set for yourself, dropping yeah. your two boys off at school, picking them up, um, and working for a few hours in between and, and playing, trying to play tennis or do yoga. At the same time, you and I together will probably not even have anywhere close to even half of her published work. So talk to me about, you're a writer, Susan. This is another writer. It's a totally different person, obviously. But how do you think about like what works for you as a writer? Quality versus quantity. You have written a, a book that came out in 2012, Quiet. It's like a life world shaking book. Um, you have a follow-up book, Quiet Power. And you've been gestating on this next book and you've, mm -hmm. op you've been openly gestating on it mm -hmm. about its path and its rhythms and its movement. Do you mm -hmm. feel pressure on that? How do you navigate? Just can you just 
throw, I'm throwing a million things at you so you can take it any way yeah. you want here. Well, I, I have so much to say. I, so I have two con- really contradictory um, responses to the bit that you just read, which is in some, that, that whole trend that you see in traditional um, arts and letters of like, I, I think there's a quote from uh, Cyril Coll- Connolly who said something like, um, the perambulator in the hallway, that's what they used to call stroller yeah, in, in England. The pram like the, 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 the pram in the hallway is, is the enemy of all art. It was, it was something like that. And I, the, that whole view I find so, uh, whatever is the opposite of life affirming. Um, the idea, and, and I also find cynical. it... Cynical. Cynical? Yeah, it's cynical, and it's a kind of like easy chauvinism. I mean, in, in um, the case of Colette, she was a woman, though living very much um, in a masculine style in that way. She was called a libertine by a lot of people. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, but the idea... So on the one hand, I want to say, the idea that art and family love, let's say, cannot coexist, I find to be very not just loathsome, but really dangerous because it's tell- we shouldn't be telling people you have to choose because you don't have to choose. It's not true. On the other hand, maybe you do have to choose when it comes to quantity. I mean, I don't know. You know, Some of our writer friends seem to churn out tons and tons and tons of books, um, even while having uh, you know, love and family and so on. I think it can be difficult. So I, I think everything is trade-offs. Um, so I think absolutely like love and art coexist for sure. Um, but uh, for me personally, I've definitely made the choice to, uh, focus more on just a few different projects Mm -hmm. across a lifetime and that's okay for me, but everybody's different that way. I mean, for me, it's also partly that, um, I don't really feel so much um, driven to produce lots and lots of stuff. I'm more interested in creating something where I think, well, if this book doesn't get written, that would be bad. Like the world could use that particular idea. And I may or may not succeed in that. I, I don't expect that every book that I write is necessarily going to achieve that end, but that's what I'm driven to try to get to. So the whole point is so quantity is not really relevant in my head when I think about this. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I've been really attracted to the Jeff Bezos uh, flywheel model lately where he says uh, it's not work-life balance. It's a flywheel. The energy you get from great, deep, intense family yeah. time yeah. creates the energy that creates your art or your vocation or your work. That energy fulfills you up, then gets around the flight and you feel then you come home you're really engaged and energized father or 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 whatever partner yeah. and then that, yeah. you know they I mean that that the model that this the thing can spin and it can spin fast but the energy it gets just makes the whole thing work yeah and and it's going to spin differently at different times of your life also so that's the other thing uh-huh. um you know there there are times you're going to want to be like working flat out and sometimes you might not want to be and Hopefully, life is long enough to accommodate different rhythm, different rhythms as far as that goes. I, um, you, you hinted, I, I mean, we talked yeah. about this before. Like, it's definitely to me one of the sacrifices is one of my most creative times always is late at night, and I can feel it's it's almost biological because I can feel it click in at around nine forty two every night. Nine forty two. Seriously, I'll be I'll be you know getting ready for bed and I'll be like, oh, I'm starting to have all these creative ideas, and I want to sit down at my laptop and be thinking about them, but. I know that if I do that, I can't wake up well, the next morning for off? my kids. I how just, you... I, I mean, for this stage of life, I just do, mm. you know. But you can I, go to sleep, though. You're not, like, sitting on your pillow, like, writing notes on the side table, like. I do that sometimes. Yeah. But, yeah, but I can still get to sleep. Um, so, yeah, for this stage of life, that's a trade-off. That... This is a bit uh, unrelated, but you gave me a window to asking about it because you mentioned yeah. it. But you have one. I think you have the most, I, I think your writing process is different than anyone's I've ever heard. Oh, that's it. How so? Like, like, can you tell people listening the process you're currently in the midst of as you work on your next book? Because you told me it earlier and I was like, wait, you're flying around like you're, you're <laughs> flying around. Tell me more. You're flying around the world. You're just reaching out to people that might have something interesting to say. You're going like, what are you? How do you write your books? Yeah, I am. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. I am. Um, 
you know, I have an idea or a thesis or a question that I really a question usually that I want to answer. And I just think of the process of researching and writing for however many years it takes. It's like I'm walking around the world for those years, seeing everything through the prism of that question. So what was the and question for quiet? It was, you know, what is the power of introverts mm. and, um, why is it that the, I mean, it was a few questions. Yeah. Why is it that there's such a bias against them when they're so clearly contributing in all kinds of ways that are because okay. of their temperament? So you not take in spite that. So I take that. You hold that. Yeah. And, and then, then I'm just like, every conversation is like filtered yeah. through that. Every book I read is filtered through that. Um, and, and then I might read an article. And I'm like, oh, that's really interesting. Maybe I need to go and talk to that person. Or um, I might see, you know, an advertisement for a conference. I'm thinking, oh, there's probably going to be something interesting there that I just sense is related. And so I just go and show up at the conference. So for those I take notes. And I was saying to you before, yeah. it's like, you know, you just have to be willing to withstand a lot of misses also because you never know before you get on the plane or get on the phone call or whatever it is, whether it's actually going to yield what you were hoping it would or not. So Susan but, told me over dinner tonight that she spent time going to Truth or Consequences, which is a city's name in New Mexico. In New Mexico, Because they yeah. won an award from the game show to do it, no, jump through a number of hoops and get renamed their city after this game show. And she flew there and it was very hard to get to. And she spent time with the woman who, who was played by Michelle Pfeiffer in the movie Dangerous Minds, you know, that inner city school teacher. Spent time, interviewed her, talked about her. And the net result of all that work and time was, I believe, one paragraph in quiet. Yeah, or maybe two or something. And then on and the other hand, like, yeah. okay, there, you know, there was another trip that I took with Quiet where um, I flew to, I think it was Atlanta. And I went to a Tony Robbins conference. Right. And I wrote about that. That's for a page. chapter. That's a whole chapter. <laughs> yeah. And honestly, I could have written a whole book about that conference. There was so <laughs> much to say. Um, but, you know, so that one was like, okay, you know, huge payoff if that's the yeah. rubric you, you want to use. But you can't know in advance. I so admire this process. It is so patient. It is so being able to say no to so many things. I'm assuming the pressures of the publishing industry, of your fans and your readers and this is amazing. I work with the most amazing people. I have never felt pressure from my agent, from my editors, from my publisher. Never. I like that seems really strange to me. Yeah, yeah. Not I mean, that you'd pressure me, Jim. <laughs> no, I mean, and even with Quiet, I um, I first turned in a draft of the book that was actually on deadline. Yeah. And it really was not good, and my editor said, "You know what? You should really be starting from scratch." <laughs> <laughs> and we're going to give you all the time you need to get it right. Oh. And I like walked out of her office. I, I, I you felt were like elated. I was elated because uh, I wanted all that time. I don't think I would have felt good about that. I mean, it wasn't like a lot of people in the audience were shaking their head. <laughs> Start again, please. Um, thanks for opening up Claudine at School for yeah, us. Sure. Your, your first most formative book. Can we now transition to your second, which I've brought here, which is called Do What You Are by Paul Teeger? T-I-E-G-E-R. I want to say Tiger or Tiger or Tigre. Who knows? Uh, it's published in 1992 by Little Brown and Company. The subtitle is Discover the Perfect Career for You Through the Secrets of Personality Type. On the back it says Unlock the Secrets of Personality Type, often called Myers-Briggs, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, how you process information, make decisions, and interact with the world around you. And discover the career that's right for you. It's a big, bright, orange-looking textbook with the tag, more than a million copies sold across the top. File this one under 155.264 Differential and Developmental Psychology. Susan, can you please tell us about your relationship with Do What You Are by Paul Teeger? Yeah, okay. So I came across this book when I was very improbably um, a corporate lawyer. and, um, and I, I was, Ten years Wall Street, right? Yeah, almost yeah. ten years. Well, seven years on Wall Street. And, um, you know, and I was working these crazy 16 hour days. Um, and I happened at that time to live across the street from a Barnes and Noble. And so like, no matter how late I came home from work, I think the Barnes and Thanks Noble. Thanks for giving a shout out to the bookseller tonight, by the way, <laughs> Barnes and Noble is here on the side, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah. And it was, the, it was a great one on eighth street in Greenwich village. And I think it was open till midnight. So no matter how late it was, I would go over there. And one night I got this book and, um, you know, and this book basically helps you figure out what your personality style is and then match it to the appropriate career for you. And that was the first time I had ever come across the whole idea of personality typology. Um, 
so first of all, just learning that I was an introvert and other aspects of my personality was incredibly That's when you first revelatory. learned you were an introvert. I think so. Okay, that, that or, makes I sense mean, why that's formative. Yeah, well, I mean... Because <laughs> you're the world's leading <laughs> person on introversion. Yeah, and I, I, I mean, I knew these things about myself, but I don't think I had a vocabulary mm -hmm. for it. Um, but, but this book also helps you figure out other aspects of your type. And, um, and I looked at the list of, of careers that the book matched up with my yeah. type yeah. and it was all like writer, counselor, psychologist, clergy person. Um, you know, like it didn't say corporate lawyer <laughs> anywhere on there. And and I looked at the careers it did say, and I was like, yeah, you know, that, I would love course, to do those things. That's exactly I what wanted I to be, be a doing. writer when I was four years old. Yeah. Yeah. And it, that whole constellation of, of careers. And um, so it took a few years between that epiphany moment and actually doing something about it. Mm -hmm. um, and it was actually interesting, too, because at that time, it was working in this very, you know, it was Wall Street law. So it was a place where you were well paid and people thought about how much they were earning. And I went home and I was researching about all these different types. And there are 16 different ones. Yes. And the type that I am yes. is the type. Which is? Uh, it's called INFP. Okay. For Myers-Briggs yeah. people out there. Some people are nodding. Um, they know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so the type that I was of the 16 types is the lowest paid on average, you know, <laughs> for those who are following their, um, their indicated career paths. And so it was just this interesting it moment. I'm like, book. okay, that's how lowest it's going to be. paid on. Oh, really? You came yeah. to accept that right away. Well, I mean, I, I came to take it in right away. Mm. It took me some time to actually make the shift, but, um, yeah. And then it turns out you're not lower paid now. It took a while. I mean, yeah. like, <laughs> On average. Yeah, I mean, no, when, when, you, no, but when accept, I first, yeah, because when I first started writing, I actually was writing for some years before I ever even thought of quiet, um, and I was just kind of sitting in a cafe, working on a memoir in uh -huh. sonnet form, making zero dollars per making, year. Yeah, exactly. Uh -huh. I mean, I, I figured out some. Sorry, you were working on a memoir in sonnet but, form. Yeah, I was doing that. Does anyone? Yeah. Does anyone else <laughs> know that? No one knew that. Is there pieces of that that have been published at all? No, I never tried to publish any of it. Somehow, I don't know. I somehow wasn't really ready to publish that one. I, I, I worked uh, on a whole bunch of things. Yeah, Quiet was the first thing I tried to actually publish. I mean, I, I tried to publish a few poems along the way, but not really in any serious way. So interesting. This is it. You, so um, you have a quote. Uh, from your book, whenever you try to pass as something you're not, you lose a part of yourself along the way. And on page 218 of Quiet, you say, I have found there are three key steps to identifying your own core personal projects, presumably including work. You say, number one, think back to what you love to do as a child. Number two, pay attention to the work you gravitate towards. And number three, pay attention to what you envy. Yeah, yeah. You're looking at me quizzically about the envy piece. And that came from... Um, nights out that I had with my fellow colleagues in Wall Street Law in which I would see that they would be talking about somebody who maybe was arguing a case before the Supreme Court uh -huh. or like something like that. They you know, were somebody excited who had about it. Yeah, like it was <laughs> yeah. some other person who had achieved some amazing accolade in the right. world of, of law. Right. And I remember feeling not envious in the slightest. And at first I was like, well, I'm just so great for not being envious. Um, and then I realized it wasn't that I'm a very humble person. Yeah, yeah. Like, I, I, I don't have that cardinal sin of envy that all these other humans have. But that was so wrong. Um, it was just that I wasn't envious of that. And then, um, you know, but then I started hearing of people who had become writers, and I realized, oh, that's really what I want. You know, people who the are living that life. The envy pointed you the right way. Yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, I I'm, I loved that. Yeah. I gave you a quizzical look, but I actually it made me pause in the book, put your book down, and be like, "Who do I envy?" And Jonathan Fields is also in the front row. He's a former guest on three books, and I listened to your conversation with Jonathan to prepare for this. And um, him and I have had a conversation in the past of like, you know, who of because we get to see so many lives through the podcast. You know, the podcasting, it's like, which lives do you, are you like, wow, what an interesting life that I could live or that I want. And so it's a, it's a fun topic if you look through it through the lens you've painted, not the one that's like, I want that life, my life suck. You know what I mean? Like, it's yeah, not yeah. a true I, envy, but like I mean, a, like a I, like, looking up to. Right. And I, I think the truth with all of these things is that you come at it from your kind of 
positive and light side and you come at it from your dark and shadow side and they're both part of you and they both take you to the right place if you're listening. Beautiful. So. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm kind of keeping an eye on like time at the yeah, same time sure. as we're talking. So I want to just transition to your, your third book, if that's okay, and just kind of um, move, move, kind of keep moving us forward because I also want to have time for a little bit of Q&A afterwards. And I didn't say this at the beginning, but Susan and I are also here signing books afterwards and we'll be the last to leave tonight. So if you have a one-on-one -on -one question or you want to talk to us, we'll be here. Uh, I hope you're okay that I said that on your behalf. No, it's great. <laughs> yeah. Susan's like, Neil will be the last. Okay. <laughs> no, um, no, no. okay, so the third and final <laughs> book, and we put it into book form just so that it was kind of a book for this podcast, but at first it came from just pure poetry, mm -hmm. but we'll call it a book for this. It is The Essential Rumi. Mm -hmm. This book that I'm holding up in front of everybody here today, it's a paperback, it is red, it says The Essential Rumi. At the bottom it says Translations by Coleman Barks, B-A-R-K-S. Rumi, uh, was a 13th century Persian poet, Islamic scholar, theologian, and Sufi yeah. mystic yeah. born in the Persian Empire, which, which is, and, and he was born in modern day Afghanistan. He fled the threat of the invading Mongol armies. Mm -hmm. That's a really lucky thing. We don't have to deal with that these days. Yes, we're very lucky. Um, between age seven and Genghis 12. Genghis Khan was no good. Pardon? Yeah. Genghis Khan was no yeah, good. Yeah, I don't I remember flying. It's good. We, don't have to, we think of all the things we take for granted these days. Fleeing Mongol armies is one of them. And he went to Konya. Yes. Is that right? Or is it yeah. Konya? K O N Y A. Called I think it's Konya. I could be wrong. Turkey. It's a part of it's a it's part of town Turkey. in Turkey. Okay. Okay. Yeah. No, it's not what Turkey was called. Right. Which is what yeah. I'm kind of into. <laughs> Said it was there. Um, he's been called the most popular poet in the world. He certainly is the top selling poet in the United States. You can file this under 891.551 for Persian literature. Susan, tell us about your relationship with the essential Rumi, or more broadly, the poetry of Rumi? Yeah, um, so I can't remember when this relationship started, maybe two years ago, something like that, but um, I came, <clears throat> excuse me, to a time of my life where I was kind of um, suffused with the emotional state of longing, and I didn't really know what it was, and it was a really sweet kind of longing. It wasn't I mean, there was, I, I guess longing inherently has an aspect of pain to it too, but it was more sweet than painful, or it was a little bit of both. And it was a longing for something or for someone, and I didn't know what it was. And um, So it, and was, it, was, a, it also, was a longing feeling, but without a, a projection at the yeah, end of it. Yeah, I didn't know exactly. Mm -hmm. um, and it was related to a kind of quest that I was already on with the book that I'm writing that I can tell you a little bit about. Um, but anyway, I just started Googling longing. Um, and it led me straight to Rumi because Rumi is a poet of longing and Sufism is a um, mystical tradition of longing. And it's, and the idea is that it's a kind of like, um, that you're longing, that we're all in some way, whether you're a believer or not, it doesn't really matter. Um, and I've been a deep agnostic my entire life. Um, so the real revelation, revelation for me is that we all have a kind of form of spiritual longing that exists kind of apart from uh, what our theological beliefs necessarily are. And I'm not now speaking for Rumi. I'm just speaking kind of yeah. for where I am and for what brought me to Rumi. But I will, there's this one poem mm. um, yes. that really blew me away on this yes. point. Yeah, I'd, I'd, love you you to, there I'd love somewhere. for you to read it. Yeah. Are you going to mm. do a reading for us? Yeah, well, this me, hope I got the right one. Is that it? Love, yeah. love yeah, dogs. Yeah, poem, love dogs. And by the way, I should say, um, so Rumi. For those of you who aren't familiar with him, I think he's the most widely read poet in the U.S. right now. I could be wrong, but something close to that. Um, so he's speaking to a lot of people. He talks about love. He talks about longing. We we often, um, if people are reading it casually, they often think of this as just straight up romantic poetry, and that's not really what it's about, or it's not all that it's about. Um, so anyway, he's got this one. Sorry, can you just pause for yeah. a second? What is, what is longing? I, I've heard you talk about it a lot now for the last couple minutes, but in my head, I'm, I'm stuck on it. Like, is it, I feel like that's an emotion I don't really know, or a feeling I don't understand. Well, maybe I'll read this poem. Okay, and that see. will illuminate okay. it for us. <laughs> I mean, it's one, one version of it. Um, so it's this poem that's called Love Dogs, and, um, and he says, one night a man was crying 
for Allah, 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 his lips grew st- sweet with the praising until a cynic said, so I've heard you calling out, but have you ever gotten any response? And the man had no answer for that. He quit praying and he fell into a confused sleep. He dreamed he saw Hitter, the guide of souls, in a thick green foliage, who asked him, why did you stop praising? And the man said, because I've never heard anything back. And Hitter said to him, the longing, this longing you express is the return message. The grief you cry out from draws you towards union. Your pure sadness that wants help is the secret cup. And then it goes on from there. Um, but, okay, so the whole, the, the book that I'm writing now really was born from this experience that I've had all my life that I could never understand, um, which was my response to sad music or minor key music, like music that has like this sorrowful, yearning mm-hmm. quality mm-hmm. to it, like a lot of Beethoven. I'm hearing like, like a Beethoven, Moonlight by Counting Crows or something yeah, like that. Yeah, or Moonlight Sonata okay, or Moonlight something Sonata. like That's that. That's a better example. More people have heard of that. <laughs> um, and I, I always had this reaction to music like that that was like, it wasn't really, I mean, it was sad, but it wasn't really sad. It was more uplifted and exalted, and there was almost a kind of ecstasy in it, and I couldn't understand why that would be the response to music that's inherently minor key and sad. Um, and, and I think it's because of this. I think it's because we're all kind of in this state where we're longing for you know, a, a perfect and beautiful world that we're never actually going to inhabit, but it's what we all want with our deepest being. You know, we all want a world where everybody is completely safe and kind and love and everything, and we're never going to get there. But there's something about the yearning for that that unleashes our best and deepest selves and our most creative selves, um, and you know, if, if you're inclined that way, our divine selves also. Mm. And, and, the creation and, of all art. Yeah, and, and it's a state of mind that, you know, if you look across art and across religion, people have been talking about this for centuries. It's quite central to the thinking of many artists and especially the mystical sides of most religions. And yet, if you look in modern day culture, just walking around, you're like, huh, what's longing? What, what is that? Yeah, I just asked yeah. that. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, unsurprisingly, yeah. because we don't really have a language for it. Um, like C.S. Lewis, the, the yes. poet, talked about yes. the inconsolable... We have two C.S. Lewis books so far on the top 1,000. Oh, really? Yeah. Which one? Yeah, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe was right. chosen by Carrie Cullen, yeah. uh, famed New York City editor. And book six out of the seven book series, anyone know the name of it? Book six was picked by Dr. Jen Gunter, Twitter's OBGYN, because she found it in her mom's basement in Winnipeg. I'm totally curious. Started with book six. Yeah, I wish I could remember the name. That's okay. Not to interrupt you. C.S. Lewis. No, it's okay. But anyway, he he um he talked about this state. He called it um the inconsolable longing for we know not what, and um you know for him that was the heart of all beauty and creativity, and for him God also. But as I say, like I think you can experience all this, regardless of where you stand theologically. Whoa, that's a big concept. I know. I know, and it's really hard to get it right. That's why it's taking me so long. Well, you're so articulate. Like, you're so... You just put words on something right away that is shaping a, an emotion that I can quickly understand. But it, it is... It's inherently ineffable, even though I think it's so central to being human. Um, and so... Yeah. They, trying to render the ineffable into a book and really explain it, is that's the challenge. So, But I love that challenge, you know, like... I'm happy for it to take a while. Mm-hmm. The Silver Chair was the name of that book. Oh, Just came okay. back to me. Okay. And um, uh, you're happy to render the ineffable effable. Well, I'm happy to try. <laughs> I, like, I, you know, will I succeed or not? We'll see. Um, you but told, I love the process of you, trying. In the preparations for this podcast chat, you told me, uh, Neil, I'm actually going to Konya. Yeah. Turkey. Yeah, right. I, there was a comp. Now I inserted a comma between those two words. Not a, <laughs> yes, not yes, a slash. You did. You did, you Konya did. Turkey, not Konya slash Turkey. <laughs> um, and, I, and I didn't quite understand it, but you, you then told me, because uh, we're recording this in January, but, uh, you know, it won't be, re- we're not going to release this chapter until your book comes out. Um, you told me that uh, because you, you came up down with a, about a bronchitis and you didn't go on the trip, but what were you going 
to do? What were you going for? You were going to yeah. kind right. of inhabit the place that, that, uh, where Rumi, Rumi lived. lived? And what yeah, were you going to do there? Yeah. Um, so every December, um, people come from all over the world to celebrate the anniversary of Rumi's death, which is also considered his wedding night with God, like when he wedding night with dissolved God. and went back to God. Mm. Um, How many people come to this? Thousands and thousands, thousands of people, of people come people from a year. across the world. Yeah, it's a really big deal. And, and this I was has been so happening for that I couldn't go. This is like 13th century, so this has been happening for like yeah, it's a good question. I don't hundred years or something. I assume that I, has I, anyone I don't in this know room sure, been to this by chance, just to <clears> check. But yeah, no, it's, no. It's a pretty has anyone deal. heard of this? <laughs> no, this is amazing. So you're you're going down a deep pathway here, and you're you're coming up with some. You're pulling pearls from the ocean here in terms of our emotional state, our our, our way of living and, and the state we're in. And you're doing so like, with a lot of courage, Susan. I really feel that. Oh, well, thank you. I mean, the, the thing that's interesting is that, um, you know, it just so happens that my my Googling led me to Rumi and to Sufism, but every religious tradition has this aspect to it. I mean, Judaism has it, Christianity has it, they all have it. Um, so... I just happen to especially love this poetry, and that's what led me in that through that particular pathway. Uh, but I think everybody feels it. I love this. You sent me a couple poems that you loved about from Rumi. One was this one: <clears throat> "Today, like every other day, we wake up empty and frightened. Don't open the door to the study and begin reading. Take down a musical instrument. Let the beauty we love." Be what we do. There are hundreds of ways to kneel and kiss the ground. That second last line, let the beauty we love be what we do. How do we do that? Yeah, I love that, that poem blew me away when I found that. Um, and I've had exactly the experience that he's describing, which is I think for a lot of us, you know, you wake up and you still have whatever... Um, whatever internal demons you were working out through your dreaming life are still partly with you as you're getting out of bed, right? That's just part of the process of going from the unconscious to the conscious. So that's still swirling all around you and you could kind of stay there or you can go to a state of beauty. And how do you do that? You know, it's through immersing yourself in what you love and what you find beautiful. So, you know, now I try to wake up and listen to music because... For me, music is, I guess, just as he's expressing, I, I think musical music is the most beautiful thing we have. Yeah. So, yeah. Start our days by immersing With, ourselves in beauty. Yeah, yeah. And to really be open to that, it, it's so weird. It's like, um, it's like we walk around the world, we're not really, you might say this is beautiful, that's beautiful, but you're not really most of the time walking around being attuned to noticing it everywhere around you. Like there's such a ridiculous amount of beauty all over the place, or the sacred, if that's how you experience it, all over the place, every day, every you know, every minute. Um, so it's a question of orienting towards that as opposed to towards any of the other things you could orient to. Susan, thank you so much for letting us immerse ourselves in your beauty tonight. I really appreciate you coming on Three Books. Thank you so much for having me. Um, you make it really easy, so thank you. Can we have a round of applause for Miss Susan Kane, everybody? Hey, everybody! It is me again, Neil Hasricha. Oh man, how how good does it feel to be kind of like back in a live audience? Could you feel the energy in the room that night? It was palpable. Right, even though it was recorded January after a snowstorm in New York City on the very first day back to school, back to work, pre-pandemic, right? We had hardcore people who made who made it out to make that live event special. If you were there, and I know you were there, a lot of you were there. Hi, Karen in Australia. Hi, Joe in San Diego. I appreciate you coming all the way. And it was so fun to hang out. But listen, listen, before we get into the after party, I've got a special Mm, intermezzo 
More recently, on the evening of April 14th, I partnered with Susan and Magic City Books in Tulsa, Oklahoma to do a book launch virtual event for her brand new book, Bittersweet, How Sorrow and Longing Make Us Whole. I got permission to share some of the audio from that conversation. So now we're going to jump back from 2020 up to 2022, post-launch of the new book, Bittersweet, and jump into a new conversation now. Okay, here we go. We are just so excited to be welcoming Neil and Susan tonight, and without any further ado, we're going to let them get into their conversation. Please welcome Neil and Susan. Thank you both. Hello, 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 everybody. Hi, my name is Neil Pastricha. I am coming to you live from my basement in Toronto, Canada, and it is my deep honor and privilege to be hosting this conversation tonight with all of you and the incredible Susan Kane, author of, as just mentioned, Quiet which has been a New York Times bestseller for over seven years and the brand new, just out 10 days ago, brand new book, Bittersweet, called How Sorrow and Longing Make Us Whole, which we just found out, I think, yesterday is -hmm. going to be debuting at number one on the New York Times bestseller list. Congratulations, Susan. You are once again in the zeitgeist. How are you feeling tonight? What is the energy you're bringing here for all of us this evening? Oh, man. Well, first of all, I'm so happy to see you, Neil. I feel like it's been a while since we've gotten to look at each other, even virtually. So that's amazing. And um, yeah, and I'm in a state of kind of stunned amazement over this news. And I don't think the stunned amazement is really wearing off yet. So so (laughs) that's, that's, uh, that's the reality. And um, yeah, and I'm just so happy well, to see you. And well, well so happy deserved, and, and, and and likely the very beginning of another giant global conversation that, as everybody watching knows, kind of starts in places and conversations kind of like this one. We are hanging out and partnering together with Magic City Books down in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And I asked just a second ago in the chat, I said, hey, for the, for the 40 people on here so far, what's a word to describe how you are feeling or where you're from? Melissa is calm in Washington, D.C. Rachel is reflective in New Jersey. Susan is tender in Boston. Tracy is anxious in San Diego. Um, Mandy is feeling melancholy. So we've got, we have, we've got a wide range of emotions here. And so the question I want to start with, for everybody watching right now, please use the chat, and for you, Susan, as the chat sort of populates, is what would make this a great hour? What would make this a lot of fun? And how would this answer the hopes you have for it this evening? Susan, you have the benefit, unlike all the rest of us, of having done this, I think, every night for the the past (laughs) 10 days. Um, So you can give us some best practices, but also for the people watching uh, at home or on your deck or in your car or or, uh, wherever you are, um, what are some wishes you have for this evening? Because what I don't want to do is just do us Q&A, and then it turns out everybody was hoping for the chance to ask questions, or or let's let's hear what the audience wants. What do you want, Susan, and what do we want in order to make this a great hour? Okay, so I love that you're asking that question for the audience, so I can't wait to hear what the audience says, and I, I actually really do want to leave um, the answering of that question to the audience, because okay. as you say, I've done this a bunch of times. I, I'm My goal is really to you know give all of you what you're looking for. But what I want to say is, in a way, what has already happened has exceeded a particular expectation I have, which is that, okay, you know, you and I, we both, for part of our work lives, we do a lot of virtual talks, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Often with, with business or organizational audiences. And I don't know if you've had this experience, but I find very often those talks begin by somebody asking a question in the chat box, just the way you did just now Mm -hmm. of like, where are you writing in from and how's everybody feeling tonight? And usually the answers to those questions are always kind of like relentlessly positive. And and it's great if everybody truly is feeling happy, as happy, as upbeat, as thrilled to be there as they are professing to feel, you know, then Uh God bless. That's wonderful. Ready to go. Yeah. Yeah. But there's like no way that that's true. (laughs) And um, so the first person who wrote in tonight said she was feeling melancholic and I thought, okay, you know, 
if you now feel like you have permission to say the truth, then like we can maybe all go home. Yes. Um, like the, the job is done. Yes. Yes. Wonderful. Yeah. Well, let's keep that going. By the way, before we started tonight, I texted Susan just a few minutes before we started. And I said, maybe you were already going to do this. Susan. I said, bring a bittersweet drink and a bittersweet snack. And what did you bring? And then I'll tell you what I brought. And then we'll ask everybody else if they, if anybody else is drinking something or eating something that goes with the, the theme of the evening. So okay. what did you bring with you? If you, if you brought anything? So, I mean, in terms of my snack, I didn't yeah. need to bring anything because I'm sitting here in my office and always in my office, I have this drawer that's next to me. You can't see it, but in the drawer are bittersweet chocolate chips. Nice. Which I have loved all my life before yes. I ever thought of writing a book called Bittersweet. That was that's like perfect. my thing. Yeah. And we bonded over our love of chocolate. Uh, I, yeah. yeah I, brought, I brought those in honor of you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Kilogram size bag. And what about the drink? <laughs> and the drink, I have my um, Bailey's Irish cream, nice. which for, <laughs> like for those of you who have read Quiet, you know, this is like my drink. This is what I, you know, I used to have this terrible public speaking phobia, which I have miraculously overcome. Um, but in the days when the phobia was still at work, um, my husband used to give me this before I would have to go on stage, you know, and it took the edge off a little bit. Yeah. And so we actually, he he brought out the Baileys last night when we, when we heard the news (laughs) about, about the book hitting number one. Oh, wow. That can, and congratulations. That is a great drink. I brought something, I brought an orange juice with lime, which is a little known kind of special drink, but you know, the bitter and the sweet together is a really nice combo. Huh, never mm. heard of that. I like so, it. Um, give it a shot sometime. Susan, for everybody joining that that does not have the background, I know everybody's got the book mailed to them all over the place. San Diego, mm-hmm. New Jersey, Minnesota, people have the book. What is the heart of this book and this conversation? The heart of it. Um, yeah. The heart of it is that I went on a years long quest, and I mean years, um, to figure out why it is that sad music can feel so transcendent um, and that, but quickly realized, you know, in early, early in that quest that, that it, the question wasn't really only about sad music. It was really about like this broader tradition of bittersweetness that exists in all of our religions and our artistic and literary heritage. And, um, and the realization that bittersweetness is one of the best sources that we have of creativity and connection. And as I say, transcendence. Um, And yet we live in a culture that does not allow us to give voice to that at all. So here we've got these great, you know, superpowers just kind of sitting there untouched, underutilized, underexplored. um, Mm -hmm. And I wanted to shine a light on that. Thank you very much. By the way, I should let you know, Stephanie's having bittersweet chocolate chips and a huckleberry drink, which I don't know what that is. Huckleberry drink, but it sounds delicious. Barbara is at the movies with my kids. It's amazing. You can multitask <laughs> like this. That is um, really incredible. They're having a popcorn yeah. and a diet ginger ale. Uh, Mandy is enjoying some bittersweet chocolate afterwards. Tracy is having dinner time. And my husband made me a sandwich, hopefully with some, I don't know, I'm picturing like <laughs> pickles, and may you know some sort of bittersweet combo on there, Tracy. Um, use it. You you use the word bittersweetness in the answer there. Well, how do you define bittersweetness? When you, bittersweet. when you say this untapped power is beside us, keep adding um, more structure to that word for us um, yeah. and me. <laughs> so bittersweetness, it's the awareness and the recognition that that joy and sorrow, that light and dark are forever paired that that Mm. is what, Mm -hmm. that is what life is. Um, It's, it's these two poles and it's the, it's, it's a deep awareness of the impermanence of everything. And it's also that what comes with, with, with all these awarenesses is this kind of really deeply piercing joy at the beauty of the world. Mm -hmm. Um, And, and, and if you want, Mm -hmm. if you Neil or, or if um, anybody listening tonight wants to think about how or ask themselves how prone you are to these kinds of states of bittersweetness. Um, I have a quiz that I developed and I did it together with, with two really dear friends and psychologists. You you may know them, Neil, Scott Barry Kaufman and and David Yadin, who I love. Um, And and so we came up with this list of questions um, and I'll I'll read to you some of the questions now. I don't know if, did you take the quiz before? 
Yeah, I did. I, I, I actually have, have it. I won't say my answer till, till you ask the, the room. Okay. Well, I'm not going to, I'm not going to go through all of it, I think, but I'll just give the room um, some examples of a few of them. So it's questions like, um, do you react intensely to art, music, or nature? Um, have others called you an old soul? Do you, do you love sad music? Do you draw comfort or inspiration from a rainy day? Mm -hmm. um, uh, do you find yourself getting goosebumps several times a day or more? Mm. And, um, and, and yeah, and, and these questions give you a sense, not, the yeah. idea is not that you would be feeling bittersweet all the time, but just like a certain proneness to the, that bittersweet state Do you feel elevated by mind. sad music? Mm -hmm. Do you seek out beauty in your everyday life? Some of these I put 10 on and others I put zero or one. I don't get goosebumps. I get goosebumps twice a year. So Are I put, you, you know, serious. I put one on that when my wife gets goosebumps all the time. Having, right, having said right. that, my answer was still in the, in the above five. I was 6.4. Right. Because so, you were kind of like, uh, well, I got, I got 10 on, <laughs> I got 10 on other. Do you feel the ecstatic is close at hand? 10. Do you speak of <laughs> beauty in your everyday life? 10. Do you react intensely to music or nature? 10. But do you know what the author C.S. Lewis meant when he described joy as a sharp, wonderful stab of longing? I put zero. I don't, I don't, I have, I have no idea what he's talking about. <laughs> I don't understand <laughs> that at all. So yeah. So for those watching, again, that's the that folks. Remind live. me, by the way, I'm sorry to interrupt yeah. you, but remind me after to describe to you what he meant. Cause once no, no, you know no, what I he actually, meant, I, I want, I want to see if, I want to see if you actually do feel it or not. Well, do you put your hand up? See at the bottom of the screen it says raise hand. So let's use this as another interactive device. Put your hand up if you would like, Susan, to expand on this quote. <laughs> what did C.S. Lewis mean when he described joy as a sharp, wonderful stab of longing? If this is of interest to you, raise your hand. Um, and we have other questions starting to come in, by the way, as this is happening. And other people who are telling us what they're eating. Patricia is drinking a Manhattan <laughs> with triscuits and sharp cheddar cheese spread. Boom! Patricia, you nailed it. That is such, a, I mean, I'm not, I don't write the book, but that sounds like such a bittersweet snack and drink. Susan Foley, chocolate mint tea with lap fro egg candy. L-A-P-H-R-O-I-A-G. Uh, do you know what that kind of candy is, Susan? I have lap no idea, egg? but I love chocolate mint ice cream above all kinds of ice cream. I've never had chocolate mint tea before. That sounds really good. Oh, it's a scotch. Thank you for the everyone's chime in. <laughs> Whiskey scotch. Okay. Yes, thank we're you. And I, our, I raise my babies here. Our, 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 okay. So either the raise hand button did not work or nobody raised their hand, or I don't know how to read this bottom of my screen. <laughs> but as I asked that question, other questions started coming in. Susan Foley is thrown, uh, or sorry, Jennifer McPherson is throwing a question out here. Susan, what was your intention with writing this book? What what influence are you hoping that it has on our culture? So you have so far described the heart of the book. You've expanded on the word bittersweetness. Mm -hmm. You've gone into some of the questions that will help people watching either live or later understand where they fit on this scale of how bittersweet they are. Now let's go to Jennifer's question. What was your intention in writing this book? And by the way, as Susan answers for other people watching, throw questions in the chat or the Q&A, and then I'll keep trying to facilitate as we go so we can make this a true conversation. Over to you, Susan, on intention and hope for the culture, if you have oh, hopes. Gosh, I mean, okay, my original, I guess my intention started with, you could call this book in some ways, like the, the biography of a feeling, um, this feeling state of bittersweetness, which I experienced so frequently, so intensely throughout my life and have been so aware of it being like one of the deepest wells on which I draw in almost everything I do, like mm -hmm. in my personal relationships, like love relationships, um, uh, you know, in my creative work, in everything I do, I feel like this, this sense of the, the world as being simultaneously beautiful and broken is, mm -hmm. is the truth. And it's also, um, and it's also just this great, source like energy source in, in in the profound use of the word ener of the word energy um so i really wanted to understand that and and i and i wanted to find the other people out there who experience the same thing and and that actually has been like so rewarding already just in the first week or so um how, since how the book so? has come out how, how, well just because so? like is there is there one story or a, someone who's come up to you at an event or or is there anything that's come back to you already in the resonance since the books come out that strikes you as 
finding the other people. Oh God. Yeah. The letters have come flooding in and in some ways they, they echo in the most uncanny way, the letters that I got over the last decade in the wake of quiet, you know, like letters of people saying, oh my gosh, this is, this is me. And I finally feel understood. And like, I have permission to feel the way I feel. Um, but also other people who have kind of suspected that this state of mind was at the heart of everything they do. So I've heard from a lot of, certainly not exclusively, but from a lot of creative people, like a, a filmmaker from LA who just wrote to me um, and said for his whole life, he's been walking down the city streets late at night, like on his way home from a, a party or something. And he would be listening to sad minor key music. And, um, and that feeling would come over him and he, he didn't know how to describe it. He said his whole life, he's called it quote, that holy feeling. Mm. Um, and he's, I, I don't think he's a religious person mm -hmm. or like an explicitly religious person saying mm -hmm. this. Um, but there was always this sense that that holy feeling was connected to that, which which drives his, his, his art. So mm. that's been amazing. Like the, the, so I just wanted to, I wanted to understand this and I wanted to connect with other people who also understood it. And then in terms of the culture, I just feel like our culture would be a lot better off if we made space for these kinds of emotions. Um, you know, we famously now almost to a cliched degree live in a culture of quote toxic positivity where yes. it's only acceptable to talk about our positive states of mind yeah. and what that basically means is that we are not telling each other the truth and you can't have a functioning culture where people aren't telling each other the truth um, but it also means like one of the things I discovered from the book is is that when person a sees person b expressing st sorrow or in a state of just or in a state of distress, person A automatically feels closer to person B. Like it draws, it draws those two people together. This is the way humans are designed. Um, like literally we, we have a vagus nerve, which is the biggest bundle of nerves in our bodies, which regulates our breathing and our digestion. And also um, it also becomes activated when we see other beings in distress, it's like your vagus nerve gets going. So where is it? It's, 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 it's and I believe it's like the chest cavity, you know, going okay. all the way up to the brain. Um, and, and, and it's, it's big and it's fundamental and all mammals have it. Um, so the fact that this aspect of our bodies that regulates our ability to breathe is also telling us to react to the distress of others, um, is telling us that th this idea of compassion is not just like a, a nice Sunday school idea that we pay lip service to, but don't really mean. Um, it's 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 really deep. Yeah. Um, so I want to. I, I just want to give more space for talking about that. Yeah. And so two things here. Um, I want to tie in together. First, you described yeah. that filmmaker's feeling in LA of walking as that holy feeling. Yeah. And then earlier, I asked who wanted me, who wanted you to expand on the C.S. Lewis quote. And I got a private message from Magic City Books telling me that I totally didn't know how to read the. So lots of people <laughs> had over over a dozen people had their hands up, and I just had to click this button for attendees to see that. So everybody wanted us to expand on that. So I have a feeling the answer to both of these things is the same. That holy feeling that the filmmaker's describing, yeah. and the quote from C.S. Lewis. If you could recite it back to us, or I can I can pull it up again because um, in the it's in the um, uh, bittersweet quiz. Um, can you expand on that? And here, let me just say the quote one more time for people. Yeah, I, I have it right in front of me. Okay, he he basically <laughs> described joy as a quote, sharp, wonderful stab of longing. Yeah. Yeah. And that and the holy feeling, those, those are really related. Um, you know, that feeling when, uh, first I'm talking about the C.S. Lewis quote now, and then we could talk about the holy feeling too, but, um, for C.S. Lewis, um, you know that feeling when you see something intensely beautiful and it's so beautiful that it makes you cry because you're just like so moved by the beauty of it, whether it's a work of art or some interaction between two humans, whatever it is. Um, what you could say we're really crying for, the, the deep-seated reason that we're crying when we see that beauty is because we all come into this world in a state of 
longing for a more perfect and beautiful world that we feel like we belong to and have had to leave for a time. And we've expressed this longing in a thousand different ways. We express it religiously in many of our religions, you know, the longing for the Garden of Eden, um, the longing for Mecca, the longing for Zion. Um, oh, yeah. this, the Sufis call it the longing for the beloved of the soul. Mm. And, and then, you know, we, we, we have many, 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 many um, secular manifestations of it, like Dorothy longing for somewhere over the rainbow, you know, like that mm. other place mm -hmm. that we all, we, yeah. we, we glimpse is there, but, and, and, and this is whether you consider yourself, you know, atheist, believer, uh -huh. secular, religious, it makes no difference. This Every, a, you know, Star Wars, Harry Potter, Lord of the <clears throat> Rings, um, yes. the famous Joseph, Con Joseph Conrad. Yeah, Joseph Conrad. Uh, you mean Joseph Campbell. Is, Joseph Campbell. Is that who you were thinking of? Yes, thank you for yes. correcting me. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny because I was like, yes, no, that doesn't sound quite right. But yeah. you're saying, you, you're, you're reflecting back to us that this feeling is is omnipresent kind of in, in our culture and in our society and in our religions. Yeah. Now you're, so now you're saying it's everywhere, but keep taking us deeper into what it is. Well, what it is, is the great question. Um, so certainly what it is, um, and, and, and this is the feeling, by the way, that that filmmaker calls that holy feeling. And, and I know this feeling intensely. I get uh, almost every night before I go to sleep, I listen to sort of minor key type music, not so much during the day, more at night. And, and that feeling comes almost every night. Um, and almost certainly that feeling is the heart of our creative impulses, or at least one of, of the great drivers of it. Um, like why do we create in the first place? It's like, we're trying to do something that brings us a little bit closer to the mm -hmm. world that we're longing for. And that takes yeah. a thousand different expressions. You know, it could be, it, it could be a rocket to Mars and it could be making uh -huh. a sandwich for a beloved child. Like there, there's a thousand yeah. different ways of drawing closer to that world. Um, but it's one of our greatest drivers. And for those of us that aren't as um, knowledgeable about music, when you say minor key music, are there two or three songs that everybody knows around the world that you could just point to real quick? Or is there a certain Beatles tune or a certain classical music tune that can just make us mentally evoke what you're talking about? Oh, that's a really good question. And when I say minor key music, I mean, you know, like sad music, bittersweet music. Um, and I will say I actually created a bittersweet playlist. So you can find it on Apple Music or Spotify. Okay, this is where um, Magic so, City Books is going to throw the link in here before the end of the chat somehow. Yes, yes, please do. Yeah. Oh, thank you. I see somebody just said Moonlight Sonata, Moonlight Sonata. and I love that right. you said that because yeah. first of all, that's the perfect example. And second, I actually talk about this in the book. There's this amazing video that went viral of this two-year-old kid who is going, who's at his sister's piano recital and oh. he's sitting on his father's lap and he's hearing Moonlight Sonata played not so well <laughs> for the yeah. first time. Um, yeah. and, and this little two-year-old guy is so moved by the music. He's got like tears streaming down his face. And, and you can just tell from watching, it's like, he's not crying because um, someone took his toy away. He's like right. he's, he's <laughs> crying at the music. Yeah. And this video went viral and, and and when you watch it, you know why it went viral. It's because it's like people are trying to understand what the heck is this, this combination of s sorrow and intense beauty that that takes us to the depths of our souls. Right. Um, and it does. Um, so, Susan Foley yeah. chimes in. Jeff Buckley's Hallelujah. Yeah. Which is a wonderful yes. track. Michelle yes. Cohen went, mentions one I don't know. Bar Barbara. Barbara Adagio for strings. Right. From right. The Magic City book has, has thrown the Spotify playlist on here. And if you are watching this on YouTube, you know, in the year 2087, um, that <laughs> we'll throw that thing down in the in the in the look below the video because we'll put the link <laughs> down there too. And then and I, also, I, I love by the way that somebody yeah. mentioned Hallelujah because um yeah. a, a, a friend of mine read the book, and this is someone who who doesn't think of himself as very bittersweet and didn't score particularly high on the scale. Um, and he said, but now I understand like why I love Hallelujah so much and what mm. everybody loves so much about it. Like, why did that become the song that was covered over and over and over again, you know, and played at every American idol? It's because it's tapping into that 
particular state that C.S. Lewis was talking about. Yeah. Side note, I also feel like there's something so powerful about the fact that I first heard Hallelujah as a Jeff Buckley song. Uh -huh. Super yeah. slow and high pitched and the different mm -hmm. verses. And then when I heard the Leonard Cohen, they're like, it came from like <laughs> a, a deep one. I'm like, well, oh, that's the same song. There's something yeah. about that too, about the stretching of that song into so many different mm -hmm. emotional valences that I think makes it really special. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there's a reason so many were drawn to cover it that way. It, it, it like to give it their own personal signature to this yeah. like almost sacred song. Okay, so two things here that you've mentioned in the last in the last sort of two and a half questions here. One is you say, you know, one thing we don't yet know or appreciate or or do well in our society, and it's kind of tied to that original question about the hope for the culture, yeah. is learn how to tap into bitter sweetness as an energy source. Um, we've talked about, I believe the Ted talk that you gave in 2019 that has just released on 10 is already going crazy viral. It's called the, the hidden power of, of rainy days and sad songs. Is that right? Yeah. yeah of sad songs and rainy days. Sad yeah. songs and rainy mm -hmm. days. So, yeah. so, okay. So uh, I'm a tactical person. Uh, give me a prescription. Are you saying like, get, get us on the way to use this as an energy source? I don't, I don't, I don't mean to get life hacky, but just, you know, what are some of the ways we can infuse our creative spirit with these powers other than it sounds like the obvious, which is playing this music, playing, playing sad music. What else um, can fill us up? Using yeah. I mean, I mean, so the, the first thing I'm just going to say is for people who really have been feeling this way all their lives and, and hear this and are like, oh my God, that's what it is. Um, the first thing is just to sort of know that, um, accept it and rejoice in it, which is mm. not something um, mm. people have been doing. And I, I know this from the letters yeah. that I'm getting already, you know, of people saying, oh my gosh, I thought this was, yeah. um, you know, like in our society, it said, oh, well, that's, if you're feeling this way, it's a symptom of being melancholy and melancholy is kind of the same thing as clinical depression. So it must mean there's something deeply wrong if you're feeling these things. In fact, that's mm -hmm. what that filmmaker said. He said he would get that holy feeling and then immediately yeah. feel like he should disavow it because it was somehow right. connected to depression. Um, so, so the first rid, thing is rid, rid the shame of feeling this way. Yeah. Yeah. And, and not only rid the shame, but like really rejoice in mm -hmm. its powers of creativity and connection. Um, in terms of like practical things, one would be to um, to infuse your life in a really conscious way with daily acts of beauty, mm. whatever those are for you. Um, you know, because that's really what we're longing for at the end of the day. We're like, we're longing for, you know, beauty, love, like truth, perfection. So engaging with beauty in a really conscious way is incredibly liberating and um, stimulating and animating. And I, I actually got into the habit of doing this as I was writing the book um, during the last few years, like when the pandemic came, I found myself falling into this habit of starting every morning, doom scrolling Twitter. And yeah. it was really bad. Um, <laughs> it just doesn't seem like you. That's why I'm laughing. <laughs> yeah, but I, I was totally doing it. And um, and I can't remember now how I got the idea, but I, I suddenly just posted one day and asked people to share with me their favorite art accounts that they follow. And everybody sent them in. And then pretty soon my whole feed was full of art. And so for the whole last two years of writing this book, I began every morning by choosing a favorite piece of art and then spending the time to link that art with a favorite poem or quote or idea or whatever. And then I would post it on my social media and then other people would react to it. And, you know, it often took like an hour to find the right art and the right quote and the right everything and post it up there. Um, so you could say that wasn't so efficient for, for the writing process, but, but it actually really was, you know, it, it centered me into a really deep and creative state of mind um, and a state where I felt connected to all the people who I was writing to, you know, cause like I've always had, um, I've, I've always had a sense of, uh, 
of the people I'm writing to and engaging with with real people around works of beauty in that way was incredibly transformative. And that's not only something, you know, as a solitary writer, you could sit and do like businesses could be doing that, right? You could be um, opening every day or beginning, you know, team retreats or meetings or whatever with people sharing works of beauty. Um, and, and, and we know that it's not only the act of creating art, but the act of consuming it and interacting with it um, that's elevating and improves health and all kinds of other markers like that that's been shown in the research. Wow. Okay. Um, so, and, and just as you're talking about that, Barbara Valente chimes in here. Your feed is so lovely. Susan Foley is chiming. I'm one of those people who felt it all my life and, and they've got a, a longer, oh, it's wonderful to have it defined. Rainy mm. days never seem sad to me. It's incubating, cleansing, calming at the same mm -hmm. time, dramatic or even unnerving in brackets, lightning, flooding. It does not feel sad to me, almost as though I'm living as the world evolves around me as part of it, as part of the fleeting beauty of it. Exactly, 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 exactly. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Um, and so, and oh, okay, this is why, this is, to me, the fact that Susan Foley just posted that comment, this is like, why anybody would write books like the whole reason is just to express something that other people feel I mean this is why I read too like that feeling of a writer put something down and you're like oh my gosh I've had that exact same experience and I never really thought to put it quite that way mm -hmm. and then you just have this moment of intense communion between the reader and the writer like yes. to me that's magical as, as so thank we... you Susan Foley yeah, and this whole conversation. Look, we're in a in a in a room with forty five other book lovers, bibliophiles, yeah. having a conversation about this ineffable something. Mm -hmm. How yeah. lucky are we, you know, to be even able to do this um, and to make space for this type of conversation yeah. on the sharing of art? By the way, you know, the last time you and I publicly spoke. Mm -hmm. was at the 92nd Street Y yep. in New York just before the pandemic began for my podcast, yep. Three Books. And mm -hmm. if, I'm, if I get permission to use the audio, I'm going to release this as a tack on to that conversation, which I've yep. held in my pocket for the two years until this book <laughs> came out. <laughs> I know, because when we recorded it, I don't think we thought it was going to be two years, did we? Was I like, oh, I'll well, be done in six months? Or what, what did uh, I think at the time? I can't remember. I don't know, but that's okay. It's fine. It was, it was, it was funny listening to it. At the beginning, we, we, we kissed like cheeks and yeah. shook hands and we sat down and I said uh, I said hey what are up with those germ people who never do who never uh Kate, hug and, and shake hands I said that it's right oh before the pandemic it's hilarious gosh, that's so I interesting haven't, I haven't kissed a cheek in two years <laughs> that's really interesting yeah yeah so we're gonna suffix that conversation with this conversation but what you're reminding me of is that the whole point of that conversation is to share formative books, share pieces of beauty, and that right. let that self be a lever into a conversation. Mm -hmm. And my first ever corporate job when I was 21 years old working in a think tank in downtown Toronto, the meetings, the lunchtime meetings were always supposed to begin with somebody standing up and bringing a piece of art You're kidding. Or, or a book to show and demonstrate to the room. And then we started the team town hall. And so oh. it was like, you're on this Friday, Neil, or you're on next Friday. And everybody had to bring a formative book or a, 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 a music or a little video. And, and they started the meetings like that. And you didn't know what was going to, what was going to happen, but everyone was, everyone's interest was peaked. And you're making me realize with the way you've converted your feed to like all art. Um, wow. That's a really natural, easy way for anyone to sort of start to sow this type of energy source into their uh, community or professional or corporate organizations is really, that's a beautiful idea. Yeah, no, absolutely. And then I, I guess I would say the converse of that idea is to be creating space where it's needed for people to actually tell the truth about what they're feeling. You know, like we were talking about those chat boxes um, that are always filled with very thrilled and pumped people. Yeah. Um, and, you know, like if the, if the if if a team leader kind of goes first and demonstrates, oh, it, it's actually okay to talk about feelings in a more nuanced way, you know, that mm -hmm. suddenly makes it acceptable for everyone. And I'm not talking about like creating a culture where people feel obliged to divulge their most personal whatever that they're going yeah. through, but you know, yeah. just just to create some space. Yeah, and this ties really well with a thought and a phrase that you mentioned heavily in your book, one of my mm -hmm. favorite chapters. And uh, a, a sort of 
little meringue peak you mentioned earlier that I'm going to tie back us, tie us back to right now, which is toxic positivity. Mm -hmm. And so chapter six of your book is titled, how do we transcend or how can we transcend enforced positivity in the workplace and beyond? And this is related to, of course, you saying, you know, how do we make Mm -hmm. space for the full gamut of true emotions? Um, couple questions here. One, I'd love you to define toxic positivity. So we're all coming at that term from a level playing field. And second of all, um, uh, my whole body of work (laughs) is around cultivating happiness habits, or how do you use the power of you know, uh, forest therapy, Shinrin Yoku, jur- journaling, uh, reading mm-hmm. fiction. These are things I talk about in order to cultivate a more positive mindset because, hey, I think of happiness as, as a practice, as a habit. And yeah, when I'm yeah. happier, I, I am. I do. I am more creative and I, I do have stronger relationships. So how does how do you define toxic positivity, <clears throat> specifically the toxic part of it? And how does the evolving conversation on bittersweetness fit together with, I think, a pretty robust existing conversation, such as me, of course, it's people like, Daniel Gilbert and Gretchen Rubin and, you know, that whole world Mm -hmm. of happiness. How do those two worlds uh, come together? How do you see them uh, intertwining in a positive way? I'll tell you exactly. Or or, or in the full range of ways they could entwine. Yeah, no. And I I believe there is absolutely no contradiction between, you know, what you or some of the others you just mentioned are doing and what I'm talking about. Um, And in fact, I originally was calling this book, The Happiness of Melancholy, until oh. people told me that was a really bad title. Um, so, but it's still called that in my, like, in my computer files. That's what it's called. And, um, and that's because I, it's not like, I, I don't like feeling sad any more than anybody else does. I enjoy feeling happy just like everyone does. It, but but there, there's something about um, this kind of state, like, the way Susan Foley was just saying, you know, rainy days never seem sad to me. That's mm-hmm. what I'm talking about. There's something about telling the truth of the full range of human experience that is actually a happiness practice. It's a happiness practice. And, and we, we have been denying ourselves that practice. And in terms of all the work of all these other people even talking about, there's actually some people are starting to call it a second wave in positive psychology because as you know, positive psychology started out a few decades ago with the idea being that before that psychology and psychiatry had only been about curing mental challenges and problems. And and then the idea was, well, what makes human beings thrive? Mm -hmm. And it, and I would uh, say for the Ma- first Martin Seligman, Mihal Chick sent me high in 1998 to 2000, right? That era. Yeah, 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 exactly. And you know, so so that's been this like kind of incredible boom. juggernaut and and mm-hmm. boom with all these amazing insights that have come from it. I think that there had been at the beginning of that boom a tendency to assume that if you're wanting to look at what makes people thrive, it's got to be only things like you know kind of straight up upbeatness, straight up positivity, straight up optimism, um, instead of looking at a more kind of shaded and nuanced vision of what human nature actually is and can be. Um, And so there are people who are starting to talk now about a second wave in positive psychology that looks at these more nuanced states um, and makes space for them and sees them as, as a source of great generativity. Yeah. And you know, a comment just came in that makes so much sense. Kristen, you just nailed it in quotes, a good cry. Yeah. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And, and another uh, phrase that pops into my mind, it's a bit of a, I think of it as a bit of a cousin book, frankly, to quiet uh, is uh, the book solitude by Michael Harris, Mm -hmm. who is a Vancouver based, uh, really profound philosophical thinker. And that book solitude really opened my eyes to to be really with a butter knife. It's like, if lonely is alone and sad, then solitude is alone and happy. And again, yeah, that's not yeah. really it. That's a pretty overly simplistic word, but that book as just a side note to encourage mm-hmm. other readers who love books to check mm-hmm. out that book really colors in a whole world that I knew nothing about. In mm-hmm. fact, I, mm-hmm. I thought going to the movies by yourself automatically meant, you know, that was not a, you wouldn't do that in a positive state, uh, you right, know, growing up. Right, that's how right, I felt, right? right. right? Mm-hmm. And uh, now, of course, I wouldn't go to the movie with anybody. I would, <laughs> <laughs> give me a break, you know, for my kids. Uh, 
but there's something about, I think, solitude as an ingredient in this as well. And you say second wave of positive psychology. Of course, my itchiness is like, please expand. What, you know, what, what else, where else is this research taking us? And of course, I'm assuming bittersweet is going to be a big part of it. I mean, so some of the people who have um, written on the positive, um, I'm sorry, on the second wave of positive psychology, they're looking at uh, words in other cultures and noticing the way other cultures have made space um, mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. this sort of more nuanced view mm -hmm. of emotion. So for example, sodaje, which is the, the Portuguese word for kind of like a longing for a beautiful experience or a love that you may never even have, have experienced in the first place, and yet you're still longing for it. Mm -hmm. And that's, and, and so Jaja is said to be the heart of all Portuguese and Brazilian music. Um, so it's, yeah. it's like a very generative thing. And then like in ancient Greece, the word was potos and, and potos meant a yearning for everything good and beautiful and true that was unattainable, but you would still yearn for it. And it was understood, it was understood in that culture that that emotion was generative. So mm -hmm. Odysseus in, in, in Homer's famous Odyssey, yes. um, that poem, which is a poem of epic adventure and action, that poem starts with Odysseus weeping on a beach full of longing. He's in a state of potos. He's in a state of longing for his, his homeland of Ithaca. And it's because he's weeping on the beach with homesickness that he sets sail and begins this adventure. So it's like, that's always been, mm -hmm. you, you see this time and time again in our traditions, that it's always been understood that that, that sense, that kind of melancholic longing is, is a catapulting generative force. Ooh, um, catapulting generative force. It also reminds me of the epigraph in your book. There is a crack, a crack in everything. That's how the light gets in from, I don't know what LC comma, oh, Leonard Cohen. That's a Leonard Cohen song. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. LC. LC, it's, it's for uh, for those of us who don't know him, he's Leonard Cohen, but for LC, <laughs> I, I get it. Yeah, because I dedicated the book in his memory because um, like he he influenced me so profoundly, his uh -huh. his music, his poetry, his life philosophy. Um, and, and you could sum up his life philosophy in that one quote from his song, Anthem. That, it, it, yeah. Does it also remind you of that Japanese word, which I'm forgetting, that describes the the fixing of broken ceramics with gold. Oh yeah, kintsugi. I, I think you're thinking of. Um, I, I don't know I, if I'm pronouncing it correctly, but yeah, yeah the idea uh, that tell, you, tell us what that is, and then let's take it back so 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 we can define toxic positivity. Because I see there's comments coming in on the toxic positivity side. I just want to uh, color that conversation into. So yeah, sure. So, uh, you just said the Japanese word, which I will not will not attempt. But what what is that? Yeah, and again, I may be getting it wrong for any okay. Japanese speakers here, but it it yeah. it's looks like kintsugi in the way that it's spelled in English. Uh -huh. um, and it, it basically describes an art form where you take um, broken pieces of pottery. Mm -hmm. um, like let's say you had, um, you know, a vase and, and it, that's broken into pieces. And then you, you join those pieces together um, and you attach them with like gold filigree that's visible. Yeah. And so the idea is that the, the viewer of this, ob that the object has been made more beautiful by the fact that it has been broken and visibly joined together with gold. What a beautiful metaphor, right, for and, life. Yeah, absolutely. And you know what's incredible about that is, um, so we were just talking about Leonard Cohn. His, his philosophy, it's really the philosophy of this book. He drew it from the Kabbalah, which is the, the mystical side of Judaism, where the central metaphor is that all of creation was originally an intact vessel just like with the Japanese art form, it was originally an intact vessel, um, a divine vessel that then shattered. And the world that we live in now is the world after that shattering. Um, but those divine shards of pottery of that original creation, they're scattered all around us. And our job, our task on this earth is to pick up those pieces of, of divine shards wherever we might find them. Wow. And yeah. And so that's what I'm saying. It's like, this is not an anti-positive philosophy. This mm -hmm. is like a philosophy mm -hmm. that, that admits the truth about the brokenness and things. And, yes. and, and then is incredibly hopeful about what we can do in the face of that. Yeah. You know, this reminds me of a good friend of mine, um, 
whose name I won't say, but he was working at a, a really fancy, high-powered uh, consulting company uh, mm-hmm. in New York City, and okay. he was experiencing great stress and overwhelm yeah. and just uh, inching towards burnout. And so he saw the in-house uh, psychologist, mm-hmm. and the in-house psychologist said, every day on your walk to work, on your walk to the office, pick up three pieces of beauty and put them on your desk. Wow. And he said that the act of doing so was so profound in his life Mm -hmm. that since leaving the company and doing his own thing, you know, many years later, he still does that every day. And so whether that's like a bright red maple leaf or a perfectly round pebble at the top of like a Manhattan, you know, subway entrance, you know, or um, he's now keenly looking yeah. Maybe for what you described earlier as inserting into your life these profound or simple moments of beauty, but because he was he was told to do that as a as a prescription to ground and center himself. So then when you get to work, does the work seem that big a deal? No, because you you realize that you're like a person floating in outer space on the planet. You know, <laughs> you get that you get that sense, right? Well, so. yeah, and you're also training yourself to find those moments of beauty, even in the context of a work day and a job that you don't particularly love, let's say you can still yeah. find those moments. Yeah. Yeah. They're just trying to eke out a little more productivity from them. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay. We'll make you happy when you get here, then you'll do better work. Um, on the toxic positivity point, maybe uh, Barbara opens it up for us. Uh, they say, when I was going through breast cancer, if I expressed a down day or some less than positive feelings, people all around me did all they could to encourage me to be positive. It was like I was not allowed to be sad Mm -hmm. or upset or have a rough day. And when I did, those around me feared it so much and forced me to be positive to a fault and at all costs. So for those of us who don't know this phrase very well, toxic positivity, where does it most appear? And how do we uh, inch ourselves back from the precipice, the precipice of, uh, uh, of negativity that it, well, what, what is it? And what do we, how do we watch out for this thing? Cause you're bringing it to life here for us. So it appears everywhere, you know, it appears in our workplaces for sure. It appears in our parenting unconsciously. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it, it appears basically in the, any major cultural like mm-hmm. institution, um, just cause our culture is so suffused with it. Um, yeah. yeah. And it's basically the Calvinism, that- right? Yeah, originally it does come from there. I mean, uh, gosh, it took like a, a whole chapter to explain the history of it. So, uh, but I'm just going to give like a super we'll, we'll take the tweet. dense version, <laughs> the tweet version. Um, basically, and I'm going to leave even leave out Calvinism from the condensed version. But basically, we in the U.S. became an incredibly business focused society, and I don't mean this as a knock on business per se. Um, I'm fine with business, um, but what happened is that. Um, everything started to become a question of whether you succeeded or failed in business, whether you made money or you didn't, whether you kept the money you made or or lost Mm -hmm. it in one of the Uh, the many uh, economic panics. Loser commits suicide. Exactly. Yes. So, so we start looking at everybody, right. Everybody's Mm -hmm. either a winner or a loser. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And in the great depression, someone commits suicide, loser commits suicide after Mm -hmm. losing all their money. So it's like no longer is a loser, someone who has gotten unlucky and lost something. It's like something internal to who they are. Yeah. And the more you look at people that way, the more it becomes absolutely intolerable to ever speak of loss or melancholy or the preference for rainy days or anything like that. Because to do that is to mark yourself as one of these people who is predetermined in some way to be a loser. Um, and that's the cultural heritage that we have. And you, know, you talk about where do you see it? Like an, another huge place. I, I did a lot of research for the book um, at my old college alma mater. I just went and talked to students there and they started telling me about this phenomenon that they call effortless perfection. Oh yeah. 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 Which, which for them is basically- talking about this with uh, Brené Brown. Yeah. 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 And it, and it's basically the idea that like that these students feel that they're supposed to be, you know, thin and and attractive and socially adept and get fantastic grades and everything. And not only should they be perfect in every domain, but it should all appear to come effortlessly, even though everyone knows it can't. Well, why is that? Because they they have to mark themselves as winners. You don't so that's, want that's still today at current college campuses today. 
Oh yeah, very much so. I so mean, what? That- what is that? That seems like more so than than it used to be, though. I mean, when I went to college, you know, everybody had bedhead and sweatpants and smelled funny. You know what I mean? It wasn't. I don't remember that feeling from college. Do you? I do actually. I okay. mean. You might I, I, go to a fancy school. <laughs> I mean, I, I don't know. I don't remember the term. Like, I, I don't think that yeah. term existed back yeah. then. But yeah, I did think I did feel that there was a feeling that everybody was supposed to be very. So this is what shiny you are, the surface. This is the type of feeling you're fighting against. Yeah, uh, that, this is the type of uh, uh, veneer that you want to help shatter. Yeah, exactly. Because uh-huh. what's happening? I mean. Even before the pandemic, there's been a lot of talk in the pandemic about um, the rise of anxiety and depression um, in teenagers and college students, but that was happening even before the pandemic, certainly gotten worse since then, Um, but it was happening even before. And, you know, you would see this phenomenon of of these college kids who on day one would Mm -hmm. do an Instagram post of themselves, you know, looking perfect and smiling, surrounded Mm -hmm. by all their friends, and then die by suicide two days later. Oh, and, and, and like that kept happening. Oh, and, um, and like, you wonder what, what's the disconnect between this seemingly perfect self presentation and what people are actually feeling and whether if there's, if there were more of a space opened up to be humanly yeah. imperfect, you know whether there would be le- like the, you'd let some of the pressure out. You know, what's so interesting is that for a number of years I was going, I'm, I live in Canada. I'm in Toronto, Canada. Yeah, for yeah. a number of years, I was going monthly on a, on a, the top morning show in, in the country, uh, or one of the top ones called City Line. I was coming in as a someone. I'm I'm, I'm worried about the phrase happiness expert. I, I'd come in and give people tools and habits and ideas. And they started doing a show on Wednesdays called City Line Real R E A L, where nobody mm. wore makeup. Oh, interesting. And they wore like casual clothes, and yeah. it became like their most popular shows. And I remember I showed up and I wore makeup because I always put on makeup for the tv show and they're like are you wearing makeup i was like yeah they're like, take it off you're not allowed to wear makeup it's wednesday I was like, what? but it's it's showing some of the uh momentum in in society there's also that famous uh solange i think uh, album cover where she's you know really is it solange i think or Macy? i can't remember the keys not wearing makeup like a really uh-huh. kind of you know, that that album cover where she, it's like a purposeful kind of non makeupy done up look and I, I don't our, know that one. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Go ahead. No, no. One of our mutual contacts, Mel Robbins, says that one of the most common questions or comments she gets on her social media is, uh, I love how you don't wear makeup. Oh, interesting. And does yeah. she do it as a statement or does she just not really like putting it on in the morning? I think she's just, that's just Mel. Like she's just, yeah. she's just hanging out at her house, taking the selfie kind of thing. Yeah. You yeah, know? yeah. Yeah. And people like that. They like that there's some sort of veneer puncturing happening when she does it like that. Right, right. I put right, on right. a nice shirt and I am wearing makeup now, but maybe we should have just, I should have had a shiny, sweaty face in order to build connection here. I don't know. I, I mean, I, I I don't mean to be extreme about it. Like, I, I think that we love dressing up and and I think it's human to love self-presentation and to, yeah. and to engage in self-presentation. So I'm not saying yeah. like do away with the whole thing. I, I, it's yeah. more just like, um, we just need to kind of make space for another frequency ah. that, that I think has been shut out. Ah, well, Susan, you have helped us make space for another frequency here tonight. Um, I am going to formally, cause I noticed we're at the time we're just going to, we're going to stick around, but I, I'm going to formally say, Huge thank you for the gift to the world. This incredible new book. Congratulations on its debut as number one on the New York Times bestseller list. And thank you so much for for beginning this global conversation around the bittersweetness of life. Thank you so much, Neil, for for being here with us and giving us your characteristic, amazing energy. Um, And I also want to say a special shout out and thanks to those of you who are participating in the chats. Like, I really loved your comments. I don't think I saw them all. Um, but the ones that I saw were just great, you know, and gave me that moment that, as I told you, is my whole motive for writing in the first place. So thanks for that. Hey, everybody, this is just me, just Neil again, hanging out in my basement beside my beautiful son. Hello, little buddy. You can say hello. 
Hello. Hello. Hello. Thank you for recording with me today. Uh, listening back on the conversation with Susan Kane. Okay. So what quote jumped out to you today? I got about 15 written down right in front of me. Uh, so many jump out for me. How about this one? There are a thousand messages that the world is sending you all the time that unwittingly stand in between you and the life that you are really meant to be leading. Ah, <sighs> that feels like bomb on my itchy chest, right? As algorithms, uh, you know, advertisements, uh, billboards, signs, signs everywhere, trying to corral and 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 sort of push our behavior towards capitalistic benefits, right? You got to buy more stuff. You got to, you got to do more things. You got to, you got to travel. You got to, you got to wear deodorant or everyone's going to, you know, think that you're a terrible person. Look, what I'm trying to say here is forget the deodorant. <laughs> I, I, I truthfully, I, I hardly wear deodorant. I don't smell. I, why do you need this stuff? That's the point. Forget what everything's telling you. Just live the life that you want to be leading. I love that. Thank you, Susan. How about this one? On reading, she says, you read a book and you are like mainlining into another person's heart and soul and they into yours. I love this for a lot of reasons. One of the biggest, of course, is that it sort of emphasizes uh, the thesis of this program, which is that books are the thing. They are, they, are, they are arguably the most compressed form of wisdom we have ever had, will ever have. They're how we talk to every voice from the past and into the future. They are a way that we feel and touch and see so much of the emotional valence that we're lucky to experience as human beings. Mainlining is a great word, and then heart and soul are great words because they are the ineffable essences of who we are. Thank you, Susan, for that quote. And uh, it's hard to pick a third one. There's lots here. How about this one? If you truly believe that your children should be who they are, your children are going to know that. Simple as that. If you truly believe that your children should be who they are, your children are going to know that. I believe you are who you are. I believe you are who you are. Whatever you are, that's good. That's good. Whatever you are, that's good. <laughs> Got a really big smile from my three-year-old son here. Big long hair and his dinosaur hoodie and his red and green striped pajamas. Home from school because one of his brothers has a cough. Anybody's got a cough in this house, everybody's home. That's the way it is. So many other quotes we could jump out on longing, on envy. How about that conversation on envy? I love that. I think the truth with all these things is that you come at it from your positive and light side and you come at it from your dark and your shadow side and they're both part of you and they both take you to the right place if you're listening. Isn't this wo woman like a, like, a, like a fountain of wisdom, right? She speaks a bit quietly. She speaks a bit... Quietly, that's the name of her book, obviously. But she's so emotionally articulate. I'll put those two words together because she describes things in a way that hardly anyone in the world is able to do. Susan Kane, you are incredible. I so value your friendship, your love, your participation in this conversation, and your incredible books, Quiet and Bittersweet. Never mind the fact that there's been a lot of other kind of supplemental books around quiet because it took the world by storm as I am, as Bittersweet is doing as we speak right now. Susan Kane, thank you for adding three more books to our top 1,000, including number 698, Claudine at School by Colette. Full name, Sidani Gabrielle Colette. We might just put Colette on the top 1,000. Number 697, Do What You Are by Paul Teeger, T-I-E-G-E-R. And number 696, uh, did I get that right? Is it 98, 97? Yeah, 96, The Essential Rumi by Rumi, R-U-M-I. Arguably the most popular poet the world has ever known. If uh, Instagram quotes or anything to go, to go by, that is definitely true. Um, which one are you going to get? Are you going to get any of them? Are you going to get all of them? Are you going to add it to the list you keep folding in your purse like a lot of you have told me that you do? Are you going to start into Colette, right? Arguably the first YA novel ever written exploring themes of sexuality and lesbianism in a French boarding school in the 19, 1800s, actually, because the book was written in 1900. Or are you going to go into the poetry of Rumi? Wow, this poetry is going to stunt. It's going to slow you down. 
like you're going to have a big 500 page book on your bookshelf and you're going to read like one page a week. If you're, if you're anything like me, and it's just going to be like, some of it makes sense. Some of it doesn't. Some of it's easy. Some of it's hard. Um, but that's okay. That's fine. Whichever book you want to grab, grab wherever you want to grab it, grab it from there. Uh, an indie bookstore, a place you love, uh, online if you gotta, right? Figure out a way to get more reading in your life. This book is by and for book lovers, writers, makers, sellers, and librarians. Thank you so much for being part of this conversation. Are you still here? Are you? Did you make it past a three-second pause? Is the dog going for an extra lap around the block right now? Are you hitting the gas on that late-night drive on the highway? Are you going to do another set in that basement hotel gym in Mongolia? All right, wherever you are, shout out to Ulan Batar. Did I get that right? Did I say that right? Is that the right capital? I could be wrong. Um, wherever you are, I want to welcome you back to the end of the podcast club. This is the hangout. This is the after party. This is the post game show. This is where I talk directly to you. You talk directly to me and we share a little extra love together. It's a really, really big part of the special three booker community that I have grown to just adore over the past four years. Okay, let's get the end of the podcast club started. Hey, Neil, uh, it's Joey McGee coming from Bryan, Texas. And, uh, man, I just listened to the, the your last two episodes of The Bookmark uh, with Shane and Doug the Bookseller and love those. And uh, on my agenda today is to re-listen to the Shane Parrish edition because it was just packed with goodness. Um, anyway, loved on Doug the Bookseller, two things. I love the intro um, I know you change up things musically, and I love the on-the-fly interviews of formative books with uh, folks who came into the store. So I just wanted to give you a shout-out and say thanks. Appreciate what you're doing. Keep it up. Hope you and your family are doing great. Thanks, man. Bye. Thank you so much to Joey McGee from Bryan, Texas, for calling in with a little love for the new intro slash no intro, right? I'm just trying to do the no intro thing. Of course, chapter 102, I broke my own new idea by introducing this one, but I thought I can't throw a live two-year-old conversation that hasn't hit the world yet and not give it any context, although maybe I could have. Maybe I should have. Maybe that was my own crutch, right, Joey? Maybe that was me not being able to trust myself, right? You can Google anybody that I have on the show. You can read the intro. Hey, it's pasted right in the podcaster. Pod, like you, you look in your podcast app, there it tells you all about the person. I'm always going to write a blog post. You can click over, check out the blog post on threebooks.co. You know, eh, half the people are super famous, so you know who they are anyway. Half the people are not, and they never will be, and that's great, and that's fine. So it, it, does the bio really help? Does a big intro really help? I don't know. I'm exploring it, but Joey, you're giving me some confidence. You're inflating it. You're, you're blowing billows on, on the idea that we can do no intro. Thank you so much, Joey. But why, by the way, Joey and other people, what do you think about the new logo? Okay, that was a big change. I had my face on there, taken in a bookstore, BMV Books in Toronto, for so long. Everyone's always like, you should have been smiling in your photo. Yeah, I know, that picture isn't smiling, and I don't have any other smiling bookstore <laughs> photos. So I thought, you know what, I want this show to be a little less about me, and I want a little bit more about us. I want it to be a little bit more about a vibe, about a feeling, about a place. If you're feeling anxious, if you're feeling overwhelmed, you reach for a certain chapter that will calm you down. You want a dose of David Sedaris? Great. You want a dose of Jonathan Haidt? He's coming. Great. You want a dose of Daniels? Who doesn't? Great. You give yourself dose. You, you, you do what Jenny Lawson taught us back in 75. You, you, treat the, you treat these things like forms of medicine. And so that's what I'm trying to think with the, with the new logo. I did a little Twitter poll. This is the one people prefer, but let me know what you think. One eight three three read a lot Again, I love hearing from you. If you are hesitant to give me a call, please don't be. I won't use it if you don't like it. Or if you call back and say, hey, I left your voicemail. I don't like it. Fine, I won't. I, I respect you completely, okay? There's no trickery here. But if you want to share a formative book, feedback on the show, a dream guest, as some people have been doing, which I love dream guests, it's wonderful to hear from you. One eight three read a lot. Again, that's one eight three three R E A D A L O T. 
Drop the last T if, you, if it doesn't fit on your phone. one 833 I love hearing from you. Okay. And now it is time for a letter of the chapter. Okay. This chapter's letter comes from Millie. Millie, as some of you know, maybe all, maybe some of you don't, um, I wrote a blog called 1,000 Awesome Things from 2008 to 2012. Every single day, I wrote an awesome thing. Then in the pandemic in 2020, kind of around the time I was talking to Susan at the 92nd Street Wire just after, I was like, uh-oh, I'm feeling anxious again. I'm feeling a bit worried again. It seems like the world is ending again, and I started again. And I said to myself, back in whatever it was, March 2020, I'm going to write 1,000 more awesome things. If you subscribe to neil.blog, or you subscribe to my email newsletters, you know, because you get one in your inbox every single day. I'm doing it for a thousand days in a row. And then not too long ago, I did one number 293 called Wheelchair Accessible Nature Trails. That was because somebody named Paige Perry suggested I write about it. And I thought, I never thought about wheelchair accessible nature trails before, but I love nature trails and I'm not in a chair. So let me write this one, Wheelchair Accessible Nature Trails. And as what often happens in the world, The energy went out and the energy came back in. I got a letter from Millie. Millie says, I first heard you speak during an AbV event and uh, your story messages were so inspirational. Uh, I was diagnosed with MS in 2009 and no one really knows except a few close family and friends and now you. Once it's out there, you can't take it back. So I'm taking my time with telling people. And I know I will have courage someday. Until then, I'm strong. I'm practicing yoga. I'm loving with all my heart. I'm laughing. And I'm farting like everyone else. Your awesome thing, number 293, which is wheelchair accessible nature trails, was so inclusive. I wonder some days if I'll end up in a wheelchair. And your awesome thing was exactly what I needed to read during a moment where I was having some depressing thoughts. Ah, <sighs> this one stood out even though it was so simple. Carry on. You rock. By the way, that beautiful letter from Millie. Thank you Millie for giving me permission to share it. Uh by the way, I didn't share it without without their permission. Uh was also echoed by a number of you who said, "I'm in a chair. This is so true." And people started on facebookcom slash, th- uh, slash Neil Pasricha, so facebookcom my Neil Pasricha page, which I never talk about because I don't really want to promote Facebook. But there are a hundred thousand of you on there following me, right? And so comments sprung up. This is a great trail in this area. This is a great trail in that area. And that was a wonderful thing to see. Thank you for the love from Paige Perry for the idea and the letter from Millie afterwards. Okay, now it is time for the word of the podcast. And as you may guess, the articulate Susan Kane is absolutely going to get a word cloud. And here it is. It's really voluminous. There's this cultural vogue right now. If you read a book and you are like mainlining into another person's heart. My family were also Anglophiles and Bibliophiles. I was on an extremely short leash. She also has this kind of indomitable spirit, wild freedom that I was really um, craving. She was one of France's most preeminent writers before we started having these pitched battles. These things should never get articulated into words. Not just loathsome. Some of our writer friends seem to churn out through the prism of that question, if that's the yeah. rubric you, you want to use. That whole constellation of, of careers, epiphany moment. You're looking at me quizzically, but achieved some amazing accolade in the world of, of law. I was kind of um, suffused with the emotional state of longing. I've been a deep agnostic. It's inherently ineffable. Whoa, Mama, are you still here? Did you make it past the overwhelming word cloud that was Anglophiles and Bibliophiles and churning and prisms and constellations and epiphanies and ineffable agnostics? I mean, there was a lot there, a lot to choose from. Ineffable, that's tempting, very tempting. But today, I'm going to go with rubric. Rubric. Yes, rubric. Rubric. R-U-B-R-I-C, a noun. Partly because I heard Susan talking about it, and also partly because I heard Tim Ferriss talking about this word recently. Someone's like, I don't know. I think it was Balaji. He's like, yeah, I don't know. Uh, you could call me crazy. I don't know. And then Tim's like, oh, I'm, I'm definitely there with you, Balaji. I'm crazy too if you want to go by that rubric. I was like, what's he talking about, rubric? Rubric. According to Merriam-Webster, it means, number one, an authoritative rule. 
Mm. Two, a heading or part of a book or manuscript done or underlined in a color such as red different from the rest. That's interesting. I didn't know that. Three, an established rule, tradition, or custom. Okay, maybe we're getting closer there. Four, a guide listing specific criteria, criteria for grading or scoring academic papers. Hmm, rubric, rubric. Yeah, using it specifically, you know, Susan said, if that is the rubric you want to use, kind of like that scoring of papers, Google is a much better a heading on a document, a statement in a lit- liturgical book, a category. Is it just a category? In that case, why? The use of the word rubric spiked in 1850, went downhill from there, but then it suddenly spiked again in the last two or three years. So this is a trending word. Maybe we can go to Edom Online, the etymology. Well, before we do, let's go to Wikipedia. Rubric. In U.S. education terminology, a rubric is a scoring guide used to evaluate the quality of students' constructed responses. Put simply, it's a set of criteria for grading assignments. As my son bangs a foam sore beside me. Put simply, it is a set of criteria. That's what it is. It's a set of criteria for grading assignments. Rubrics usually contain evaluative criteria. Quality definitions for those criteria at particular levels of achievement and even a scoring strategy. Aha. Okay, now we're getting closer to it. It's a set of criteria to evaluate something. No wonder Tim's like, yeah, according to that rubric, or Susan's like, if you want to use that rubric, that set of scoring analyses, right? Makes a little bit more sense. But where did it come from? How about in the 1300s when it was the directions in a liturgical book for participation in religious services, often written in red ink? Where does the word come from? Latin, rubrica, meaning red ochre or red coloring matter. Yes, that allegedly comes from ruber, which means red or ruddy. Huh, interesting. By the way, as a birder, you know anyone that's like into like seeing a ruddy duck? Red duck, ruddy, red, same idea, same idea. And in Latin, it was red ochre or red coloring matter. You write it in red because that's who participates in the religious service. Rubric, think of it like the red ink, the way you, the way you evaluate something. I want you to try to use the word rubric in a sentence sometime this week. We've just explored it together. Believe me when I say I had no idea what it meant until right now. Very much true. Let's all use that this week if we can. Figure out some rubric, some rubric way to get rubric into your life. Thank you all so much for this pleasure, this privilege, this honor of hanging out together, talking about formative books. Until next time, remember that you are what you eat. Can you say, you are what you read? You are what you read. Keep flipping that page and I'll talk to you soon. Take care.